welcome all. Wendy Chapman, our co-chair, and Tammy Meltzer, the chair of our board, who's sitting in for district manager to help us out during the meeting. So thank you all and welcome. Um, I wanted to start the meeting off with a tribute or a moment, I should say, uh, for one of our members who's no longer with us who passed away a few weeks ago, probably our most important member. I think any of us who knew him would recognize that as being true, and that's Robert Schneck, Bob Schneck, who we all adored. We all learned so much from. Um, there was an exquisite uh, life celebration this past Saturday, and it was videotaped by the Trinity Church. I recommend that all of you go on the Trinity Church website and see it. It was really moving, profound, and extraordinary. Um, it's, a, it's a tremendous loss. I can personally say I've known, I knew Bob for many, many years, both in the capacity of the Environmental Protection Committee, which I've had the privilege of caring for so many years, and he was incredibly helpful and dogged, indefatigable, and extraordinary in every way, in addition to being a poet, as we some of us know, and a really beautiful human being with great passion and conviction, a tremendous loss. So, a moment for Bob, and um, I know he would love to be here tonight because it was very important for him. Every one of these updates, which I hope to make it you know, happening this evening, so we can think of Bob at this Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Update, which we're going to start with. So I think without further ado, we will start, if that's okay, with the team from the mayor's office of. Um, Climate and Environmental Justice, headed by Jordan Salinger and our old Diana Sweetie, who was originally <laughs> part of our board, as we all remember, is now with EBC. So, are you, I think we've got plugged in in some helpful way. I hope. <laughs> Great, and I do want to uh, second the, the note on on Bob. Um, you know, I, I think uh, it was always a, a challenge when I got his classic five part question, uh, kind of drilling down on the most complicated uh, part of, you know, the large span of, of this work um, and my attempt to, to muddle through a, a response to a five-part question uh, was always humorous. Uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, uh, his, you know, heart was in such a good place and was incredibly helpful in, in moving us all forward. Um, so appreciated uh, his role. So, hi everyone, Jordan Salinger, Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Great to see everyone in person. I know that we've been doing these uh, virtually for the last several years. Um, for folks that haven't joined, uh, uh, this is really an attempt uh, to go through all the work uh, that is going on uh, from a resiliency perspective in Manhattan. Uh, typically, uh, relatively shorter updates uh, across the projects, but I will say today we are spending uh, uh, a little bit more time, so bear with us on uh, the 5 IC4 project. There's been some significant uh, design updates uh, and, and other updates across the board that we want to spend a little bit more time on, and then we'll get into the other projects that are in construction and going through uh, an RFP process. Uh, and so, with that, let's go to the next slide. So, once again, uh, do a quick update on uh, kind of overall LMCR work through uh, 5 IC4 master plan. Uh, touch on the work that uh, Battery Park City is doing on their two projects, uh, uh, address uh, the upcoming construction uh, on battery coastal resilience, uh, the work that's being done on BMCR and the RFP process uh, for seaport coastal resilience, and then briefly touch on the upcoming engagement opportunities. Next slide. So we always show this, uh, but uh, uh, this uh, I think is uh, important to kind of set ourselves uh, straight in terms of all the work that's going on. Uh, at this point, there's roughly 1.7 billion dollars in capital investments uh, for the uh, these set of projects that combines uh, city dollars, uh, federal grants, uh, as well as uh, PPCA bonds uh, advancing this work. Uh, so I think it's a little bit cut off. Uh, on the corner, but uh, starting uh, at Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience, uh, that is uh, an ongoing construction project, uh, uh, roughly $350 million, a series of uh, flip up gates uh, that uh, our folks uh, from DDC will give you a, a brief update on. Uh, as we go down, uh, Seaport Coastal Resilience, uh, the newest project uh, uh, that we have a, a brief update on, uh, uh, that work. Uh, received a, a $50 million FEMA grant uh, last year uh, and is set to move forward. 
As I mentioned before, we'll be spending most of our time on that this area in yellow, the financial district and C4 climate resilience plan, uh, where we have some updates. Uh, we'll address uh, uh, the upcoming construction, beginning construction of the Battery Coastal Resilience Project, uh, and then uh, work on uh, the south and northwest projects uh, that Battery Park City is advancing. So once again, a holistic strategy to protect uh, Lower Manhattan from uh, sea level rise and surge. And so with that, uh, I believe I will give it uh, off to the EDC team and Alexis uh, to talk through the work on the Vita Seaport Master Plan. Great. Uh, if you could advance to the next slide. And please introduce yourselves yes. in the agency, your position at the agency. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Alexis Taylor. I'm VP of Climate Resilience at New York City EDC. I'm also the project director for the FIDI Seaport project. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see an agenda and I'll let you know who you'll be hearing from um, on our team tonight. Uh, I will um, speak to the overall process and where we are in the timeline. Um, then the bulk of tonight's update will really be a design update. And so we have our um, design consultants from one architecture, Matt Stout will be presenting on the design updates. We then also have an uh, interim update on our energy and sustainability work stream, and that will be Ronnie Dietz from Arcadis. Um, if she's not a panelist already, uh, yes, if this is a good time to add her as a panelist since she will be speaking. And then it will come back to me um, to speak on uh, implementation and overall next steps. Next slide, please. So, where are we in the overall project timeline? If you go to the next slide, um, we want to enforce, we want to, uh, uh, you know, really communicate that this project is much earlier on in its design timeframe than the other LMCR projects. Um, we are through this phase of work, which is that middle red arrow. We are advancing the, um, what we call the base infrastructure, but that's really the coastal flood defense infrastructure and what will ultimately be the in water footprint to 30% design. So 30% schematic design is what can be expected at the end of um, this contract of work. In the next slide, I'll break it down into the design phases. Um, but I just, just did want to say that the reason that it's so important to hit that 30% milestone at the end of this work is because that's what allows us to continue into the environmental review and also advance some of our regulatory conversations. Um, so what you see here is that middle part of the arrow represented in three phases. We have just completed phase five. And so tonight's update is the big design update. Um, resulting from phase five. We then have two more phases of work, um, which will take place basically from this summer until next summer. That's a phase six. That's where we're advancing that base infrastructure through to schematic design to about 20%. And then in phase seven is where we will advance that base infrastructure to 30% preliminary design. Other portions of the master plan, which include kind of building footprints, um, some of the pump stations, some of the programming will be advancing to 10%. Um, and the reason we've prioritized that coastal defense infrastructure again is because once we have that footprint set, we're really able to advance those other pieces as we're simultaneously going through environmental review. Next slide, please. Um, this is a long list of the many people that we've spoken to um, in advancing and hearing feedback for this phase of design. Um, I would like to suggest that I share this list with the, the committee and offer, um, you know, to any follow up conversations on kind of what we heard from them rather than going through the entire list tonight. Um, but just to say a lot of our focus was on maritime configurations. Um, on siting the pump station, which will be very important to the overall master plan. And then, um, as I'll speak to tonight, we have um, uh, been advancing conversations about the Coast Guard site. Next slide. And Lauren, can you move the speaker box and hide that, please, so it's no longer visible? Sorry. No, it's a good break because I'm actually going to hand it off to Matt from One Architecture to cover the design updates. 
Great, thanks. Uh, so my name again is Matthew Stout from One Architecture, and uh, I will be walking through the latest design updates. We'll start with explaining where the project left off at the end of phase four, and then we'll talk through what those changes have been in this, this last uh, year of work. So if you move to the next slide. So here what you see is an, is an overall um, aerial image of the project area and where we left off um, at the end of, of phase four. Um, phase four was an early shared vision of the waterfront, um, what could be in the future and a balance of um, function and experience. And uh, this vision uh, not only uh, cited long-term uh, flood defense, so that's the, uh, the orange dash line moving across the page, but I also envision a, um, a multi-level waterfront park um, as a part of the shoreline extension. Uh, this would provide access up and over the flood defense and ways to get to, to the waterfront. It also proposed uh, to build new resilient ferry terminals, uh, namely a new terminal for the Staten Island Ferry, the Governor's Island Ferry, um, and the city and regional ferry that we see at Pier 11 today. Um, and uh, what we can now see Great. Um, is that we, it also uh, really aims to make sure that uh, there's a, a still a strong connection between the historic seaport district and the waterfront itself. But I think one important note is that uh, the phase four design, and what you can see in the, um, the kind of magenta note at the bottom of the page, really focused on the in-water footprint uh, north of Broad Street, that is everything upstream from the Battery Maritime Building. And uh, I think that's very important because what you'll see when we walk through the design there are a lot of updates in the area around the, the ferry terminals to the south end. And again, um, as Alexis noted, uh, really focusing on on uh, developing uh, those those details. So to move on to the next. And so uh, as we work through this last phase of work, there are four major updates that we'll talk about. One is is advancing the stormwater management. Again, as noted before. Um, we did a lot of work in, in citing the, the pump station and understanding where that pump station would actually connect to um, the existing uh, sewer interceptor in the project area. And we'll see uh, where that is in our update. Um, again, we spent um, a lot of effort uh, on maritime planning, that is uh, having a better understanding of the future needs for the Staten Island Ferry, the Governor's Island Ferry, and the service that we see today at Pier 11, the, uh, the city and regional ferry services there. And so you'll see updates on on those those, those ferry layouts and, and everything there. We also looked at the northern tie-in. Uh, that is the we all know that these projects must always tie to higher ground. Um, and in this area, the northern tie-in uh, interfaces with the Brooklyn Bridge from uh, Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project, the BMCR project that uh, I know we're all very familiar with here in this room. And then uh, lastly, we updated, um, made a lot of access and circulation updates. That is, we've refined and optimized the, the circulation pathways and the, and the open space that would be in and around those, those access points. So we're excited to show you those, uh, those recent updates. We move to the next. So here we're back at that overall aerial of the project with the updated design from this phase of work. And again, what you can see and the, the, the bottom left is uh, updated layouts for the, the uh, Staten Island Ferry, which is at Whitehall Ferry Terminal in the existing location it is today. Um, a proposed uh, uh, Governor's Island Ferry Terminal, which would be just to the uh, upstream from the Battery Maritime Building at Broad Street, and, uh, and uh, a flood defense that would protect the Battery Maritime Building. And we'll talk more, um, in a lot more detail about, about the design proposal in that area. Uh, with the, the flood uh, or the um, stormwater management work stream sites, the, the uh, pump station at Old Slip, you can see in that middle call out. So that's uh, just south of south of Old Slip, and you can see we've refined the design for the for the Pier 11 replacement, and that is the, the wharf in the middle of the of the multi level waterfront. And what you'll see too is that uh, with all of this, we've really taken the opportunity to refine those that. The access paths and, and the and the green open spaces here to make them much more intuitive and uh, and direct and fluid and, and we'll look at that in more detail. So move to the next slide. And so we, as we develop this design, we realize that there's really uh, three distinct destinations um, that that this project is really creating, um, and we're calling those the first one the uh, um, 
maritime transit hub. That is the area to the south of the uh, of the project, namely between the battery and the heliport, where we really see the area is characterized by um, heavy maritime transit and, and multimodal transportation. Um, in the middle of the project area, that is uh, from Veterans Plaza uh, to the seaport. Uh, where we uh, are calling the multi-level waterfront. This is a space that's really characterized by the, the new um, open space that uh, this project is creating to get up and over the flood defense. And then the third uh, uh, destination focus area, of course, is the seaport area, which really has its own anchor of character itself and a uh, historic waterfront community that this, uh, this project aims to uh, preserve and protect. So uh, with that, uh, what we'll do is actually walk through in a little bit more detail in each one of these these destination areas and show you where the project uh, was at the end of phase four and what the, the new design updates are. If we move to the next slide. So again, we're first we're gonna talk about what we're calling the resilient ferry hub, that is the, the space from the battery uh, to the health port. This is really where you have the uh, US Coast Guard site, the uh, Whitehall Ferry Terminal, um, the Battery Maritime Building, and um, and of course the Pier Six Pier Six Heliport. And here we're looking at a graphic of where the design left off in Phase Four. Um, again, you see the the dash line at Broad Street. Uh, the previous phase of work really focused on defining that in water footprint north of this area. So. Um, we all we knew that there would needed to be a lot more attention in, in, in this particular area. Um, we also uh, knew that we needed to really uh, look more closely at the overall uh, maritime master plan, uh, reach out um, to our stakeholders and understand what the future needs for these ferry terminals would be and what amount of space they would they would require. And the previous plan again did not look in a lot of detail in how. The upland connection, namely the South Street corridor and some and, and the, the immediate streets in this area would actually connect to the project. So in this phase of work, we spent a lot of time uh, developing the, the overall design in this area with an aim to create a more integrated connection between the, the battery park, which is on the left, and um, and the rest of the project area um, to the right upstream. So if we move to the next slide. And so this is the the, um, the updated uh, uh, plan um, as it is now. Again, what you can see here is a lot of advancement in the overall layout of the slips um, and the ferry terminals themselves. What we have on the left side of the page, of course, is the uh, uh, rebuilt White Hall Ferry Terminal adjacent to uh, Peter Menua Plaza that's built in place the same place it is today. That's uh, three slips, uh, same as it exists today. Um, and then the, you can see the Battery Maritime Building is being protected by, by flood defense, and we'll talk about that in more detail. But it's uh, determined that um, to, in order to protect the building, that we would, we would build a flood defense around it. And that necessitated looking for um, a location to uh, site the Governor's Island Ferry for the future. And so just to the right of that building is the proposed Governor's Island Ferry Terminal, which is uh, three slips, uh, two of which are flexible for multi-level boarding, knowing that Governor's Island could see a lot more traffic in the future. We want to make sure that we're preparing uh, for that potential future growth. And again, you can see this, this uh, green line across the, the South Street corridor. We'll talk about that in more detail, but again, we're really interested in making sure that if we're going to rethink and rebuild this entire area, that we make something that really uh, connects the open space through this area and is more uh, intuitive for users. Move to the next. And so we'll, we'll talk specifically about the, the battery maritime building. Um, we, uh, the team studied um, many uh, alternatives and um, in protecting or uh, um, making this building more resilient. And uh, what you see here on this slide are three options that the team looked at and determined were, were not uh, selected or determined feasible. These are cross sections of the battery maritime building. So the left side of each one of these images is the city and the right side is the river. So that little dip that you see in these sections is actually the, um, the FDR as it rises out of the Battery Park underpass um, there. And so one of the first options that the team looked at was uh, building a flood wall upland of the Battery Maritime building. So that would be in the space um, where, that tr where the FDR trench is now. Um, 
And that was determined to not be uh, feasible because one uh, that would leave the building unprotected. So with with a long term sea level rise, um, we're really leaving the um, this landmark building um, unprotected, and it's also would not be uh, uh, functional as a ferry terminal as as sea level rises. It would also wall off this landmark building from from the neighborhood, and would also pose some significant construction challenges in and around the the um, the tunnel itself. In the middle of the screen, we looked at options of even just elevating the building. This is a, a large um, uh, masonry and steel uh, structure that's built not only over water, but also over um, active subway lines. Um, and it was determined that it was not feasible to, um, to lift that building uh, in place and build a flood defense. Not only was it not uh, determined feasible to, add, to lift the building, you would also have to uh, reconstruct the interior of the building in order to uh, build the flood wall, which would which would tear out the um, the uh, lobby and, and, and historic waiting room that, that we know is on the on the second floor. We also looked at all kinds of options like moving the building, for example. Um, this would obviously have the same kind of issues uh, uh, structurally that we saw for lifting the building, but also uh, really where would this building go? Um, do we uh, do we really want that building to be in a different location? So this is why uh, the the team um, selected to uh, actually protect the the building itself with flood defense on the waterfront side. So if we move to the next slide, so this is a cross section of um, the flood defense in in that area. So again, um, the left side is the city, so that's the South Street corridor with the the, the uh, FDR uh, rising out of the uh, Battery Park underpass, and then the, the East River is on the right side. So our vision is to uh, expand and improve the open space uh, along South Street. I think we all know that that space right in front of the Battery Maritime building is really congested. There's no space for cyclists. Um, it's really dangerous. Um, so the idea is to uh, find more space for um, pedestrians and cyclists by um, by finding a way to deck over the, the, the FDR on the, on the city side and the, um, in that corridor. And we'll see some images of those ideas. Um, also, uh, by relocating the uh, Governor's Island Ferry, uh, we're able to uh, create more public space on the lower level of building, namely where the Governor's Island Ferry is there today and um, provide more access to the waterfront. On the right side, what you see is that orange uh, is the T-wall, is the that's the, the flood defense. We're imagining a multi-level uh, waterfront and the inner and outer berth where the ferries dock today would then become new outdoor uh, public space um, with uh, up and over access to uh, to boats. And we'll, we'll see in the next slide uh, some images of what that could look like. So here uh, are two uh, early conceptual renderings of what this area could look and feel like with those ideas. Um, the left image, of course, is, a, is um, on the city side of the Battery Maritime building. So again, this idea of uh, covering over the FDR trench and making more space for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, we, we feel like that this really uh, creates a strong connection uh, from the battery all the way to the project to the north. This would also provide um, a new uh, waterfront access point at Broad Street, uh, which would be uh, very much needed um, for the new ferry terminal uh, that would be located abroad. So that's the building just beyond the Battery Maritime building in this image is the new uh, Governor's Island Ferry building. The image on the right um, is what it could feel like uh, when you're on top of the flood defense on the waterfront side. So what you see is the, um, the historic building, the spaces where the where today the boats um, more in the, um, in the inner and outer berth that becomes new uh, public space with pathways that lead from the upper level to the lower level. Um, and also ideas of, of, of um, finding ways for visiting and historic ships to be moored in front of the building. It's really important for us to, to find ways where this, this structure doesn't completely lose its, um, its original um, maritime intent. Um, and so we'll see some, some graphics of that as well. We'll move to the next slide. So as we transition out of this area, this is just another aerial graphic of that of that zone of a couple really exciting opportunities that we've already talked about that we'll be um, advancing with this design. Namely, one of those is the, the double level waterfront, the um, public open space along the water side of Battery Maritime Building. We're really excited about what that design could be. We're also 
uh, interested in, in, in continuing to find ways where we can activate that waterfront with historic or visiting uh, uh, vessels on the water side of the building. And then when you look to the right side of the image, it's really important for us to find ways to improve um, access and circulation on the city side. So that's making this South Street corridor connect uh, through the area um, and provide that new uh, waterfront access point at, at Broad Street. And now we'll move uh, to the north and we'll we'll talk about what we're calling the multi-level waterfront park. This is the uh, space from uh, Veterans Plaza up to um, South Street's import area. So here we're looking at a graphic of the um, uh, where we left off in phase four. Uh, again, in this area, we envision a, a multi-level waterfront um, that you would uh, be able to have a continuous uh, lower level esplanade. That's the that's the uh, the pink line across the bottom bottom of the waterfront. Um, and that the majority of this flood defense would be buried underneath the elevated landscape. So that dash line is the flood defense that is that is buried with paths that lead up and over. But we knew we needed to to uh, further advance how the, those access points would work, um, how the new uh, 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 Pier 11 uh, uh, ferry terminal would work. We needed to get into more detail with that. And we really wanted to make sure that we were designing an esplanade that worked the best for, for the community and the project. So move to the next. So this is the updated design uh, and the, the overall uh, waterfront circulation. So again, we we envision a multi-level waterfront that's a, um, a lower level um, esplanade at, at plus 11. So that's raising the, 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 the shoreline um, uh, um, four or five feet from what it is today. Um, and then an upper level waterfront um, that is on top of the flood defense at plus 24. And what we've done is, uh, uh, working with with our with our landscape partners, uh, uh, refining some of the designs so we can improve um, opportunities for waterfront overlooks. So you see the the graphic in the top left. Uh, some ideas about having these, these kind of moments of rest in this upper level to really take advantage of those amazing views we know that this waterfront creates. Um, we also looked more specifically at the esplanade design and made some pretty significant changes that we think was important. Uh, namely, in the bottom left, we uh, uh, removed a portion of the lower level left esplanade that is in conflict with uh, with the heliport, um, and for security reasons uh, that was removed. And we also looked at on the right side of the image. There's another dash line swinging out. The phase four design um, had a detached esplanade that really swung out into the water. And uh, we've looked at it in more detail and have uh, refined the design to um, really bring that esplanade back to the waterfront and improve. Uh, access up and over um, the flood defense, which we'll look at that in more detail. Into the next. And here you can see in this graphic the, the refinements that were made with the, the access circulation uh, from the city. So all of these yellow arrows are paths that would lead you up to that upper level of, of the flood defense. So these would be more park-like experience, which you would you would walk up um, from uh, the South Street corridor by the FDR and be um, one story above uh, where the waterfront is today um, on that upper level waterfront. Move to the next. And with those access uh, circulation refinements, uh, we've we've really opened up um, more consolidated space for uh, for for programming between and a, and a kind of more let's say. Uh, park like experience. So you can see uh, we're looking at creating slope landscapes similar to what you see in this precedent of, of Little Island, where the where the, the pathways would lead you up to that upper level, and then you would have uh, spaces to be able to congregate and actually use. And then on the waterfront side, we're we're looking for opportunities to do that to similar uh, situation as, for example, you see at uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. Where you have the kind of seating that would like face and you and you actually can address the, the waterfront itself and we'll, we'll see some images of that as well. Move to the next. But before we uh, uh, close on this section, just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about um, the design change um, and, uh, at Maiden Lane, namely the, um, the adjustment of the Esplanade. So if you're familiar from the last phase of work, uh, the esplanade was really detached from the waterfront and there was this enclosed cove. Um, and uh, 
the team looked at this this geometry and chose to actually move that um, esplanade to the uh, shoreline uh, for for a couple of reasons. One is that it creates uh, more ways to get up and down um, from the upper and lower level. Um, it provides more opportunity for creating integrated uh, uh, public open space. Um, and the, the, also this area is um, relatively deep water with a lot of uh, vessel traffic. And um, there was some concern about whether or not that enclosed cove would really yield the kind of ecologic conditions that um, that the project was hoping for in the initial conception of the idea. And lastly, uh, there's some concern about um, emergency access um, um, in the event that uh, someone would fall on the water in that space um, and being able to get uh, vessels there. So move to the next slide. So this is the idea of the, the what we're calling an attached uh, cove uh, esplanade. So this is again is in and around um, Maiden Lane. Um, the sketch on the on the left would be what this space could feel like if you're on the on that lower level esplanade and this um, and a, a, a public amphitheater type space that would really be facing the water and would create a, a public space that would be of and for the the waterfront here. And you could see some of the precedents. Um, that the team has been looking at here, uh, namely the Chicago River Walk and uh, the precedent in Germany. And um, before I uh, leave this, this section, I spend a little bit of time talking about uh, the uh, city and regional uh, ferry terminal. So, namely uh, the replacement for uh, Pier 11 at Wall Street that we see there today. And so, in the space of work, the team studied uh, several configurations um, for this expanded terminal. Um, uh, in reaching out to our, our stakeholders, it was determined that this future facility would require 14 slips. There are nine slips at Pier 11 today, so that's a significant um, uh, growth. And so, uh, in order to replace those uh, those uses. Uh, you would either need to add a second pier, so that's the, the graphic in the top right. So an idea of having a ferry terminal that would that would be two two piers, or you have this this what we're calling an expanded attached wharf. And the idea here is that you would have a con, uh, consolidated facility in and around the old slip. This is an area that we would have direct access to the waterfront through uh, floodgate, and there would be a waterfront plaza that would really be the gateway to um, to the to this to this ferry hub. Um, and it would provide enough space for the queuing and waiting that we know that um, the current uh, Pier 11 um, is really lacking today. We know that the queues end up underneath the FDR along the Esplanade everywhere. And so we're really looking to make sure that there's enough space for people to actually be waiting for their vessel here. Okay. I think with that, I'll pass. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah. So I'm going to speak to the design updates in this final segment. Um, which we are calling Seaport Piers. I should mention um, why we say what we are calling is because these have been kind of our internal working names, but we're very open to any input. Uh, uh, we may even want to kind of crowdsource what, how we are uh, referring to these segments, but we just wanted something that really clearly kind of spoke to the character of that waterfront. For Seaport Piers, obviously we like that it speaks to the very historic nature, but also maritime nature of this portion of the waterfront. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just mention where we left off uh, at the end of the master plan. We knew that we needed to better understand how the coastal um, flood defense would connect to that other northern portion of LMCR, in particular the BMC heart, Brooklyn Montgomery piece that um, is under construction now. We also wanted to take a closer look at rethinking this edge that's closest to uh, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, in particular with um, some consideration to opportunities to get closer to the water and or ecological opportunities there. And then the three other places that kind of where we left off had a lot to do with access and circulation um, and better understanding how we were getting people kind of up and over the coastal flood defense at certain key moments where we knew that there would be a lot of pedestrian activity or interest in access to the waterfront. Next slide. So as part of uh, this design phase, um, what we've proposed is um, to really focus on the opportunities for ecological enhancement in that Brooklyn Bridge area and just south of there. 
Um, we also know that there's some opportunities there to refine the esplanade so that we can get closer to the water. So either through get downs or other opportunities to really interact with the water there. There are really good opportunities. And as you know, there's a much beloved uh, Brooklyn Bridge Beach that already exists there. So building off of that character. Um, we also were able to adjust some of the access paths to make sure again that we were bringing into consideration those key access points um, to the piers. Um, and then we confirm that the flood defense wall will connect directly into the BMCR wall. Next slide. These were some of the things that we heard uh, in particular from our um, technical mariners workshop. Um, there was a lot of focus on um, historic vessels and how we could build flexibility into the design to make sure that there was space both for those historic vessels and the freeboard necessary. Um, and we went pretty deeply into kind of what those requirements would be. We also have on the line tonight, Scott Davis, who is our consultant that we brought on in particular to think about some of these um, maritime activities as he's a specialist in um, uh, understanding kind of the needs from a mariner's perspective of how the peers want to function. Next slide. All right, and this is just an overall diagram of how the in water footprint has changed through this design evolution and design phase five. Um, I don't have the exact numbers. We will um, be presenting those to the public as soon as we've made the calculations, but I think the overall um, understanding um, is that we've really held to largely what was the um, uh, same volume of fill um, and and over water footprint. Um, there obviously have been shifts, but the overall kind of net volume has not substantially changed. Um, it's less than 4%, I believe. Um, and that's something that we want to maintain in the future phases. This will be imp very important to our discussions, advancing kind of regulatory discussions and also mitigation for the in water footprint. Next slide. All right, so based on um, input that we've already received from stakeholders, but also opportunities for inputs on these designs and how they, how they have evolved, um, we will continue to refine the designs in the next two phases. We'll also, as I speak to next step, be um, open to any kind of design refinements or feedback on what we're showing you tonight through the end of September when we're having um, a big kind of open house event, which is meant to get a lot of feedback from um, uh, the broader public. Next slide, please. All right, I want to take a moment just to specifically discuss the US Coast Guard site. I know it is of high interest to CB1. Um, so we know through our various studies of the flood defense alignment that it will be necessary um, for us to have a portion of that flood defense on the US Coast Guard site. So even as we're refining alignments, the one certainty is we will definitely need to be on that site in order to provide a complete line of protection, largely protecting everything behind it. Um, we have not gotten to the point with the Coast Guard where we've talked about whether it should be an easement or a larger, um, let's say, ground lease. Um, I think all of those things are still on the table. The point we have gotten to in our conversations with them is really an agreement that this site is highly vulnerable um, to sea level rise and coastal defense, and that it's very important to the neighborhood behind it. And I think that as we continue to advance those conversations, even though we don't have a specific ask right now, we really want to think through with the community and with CB1, what kind of optimal alignment could also come with other co-benefits to the community. Um, so again, we're not here with kind of already with a specific ask that we're going back to. It's actually Department of Homeland Security and the Coast Guard yet. We're just not that far in the study, but I think that that openness to kind of discuss where the alignment wants to be, um, we're saying could really unlock a lot of other important considerations in the master plan. So when we talk about unlocking, we actually know that this site is also critical to a lot of kind of thinking about the overall access and circulation. It's really critical to thinking about, could you possibly shift some heavy maritime, some of the more kind of ferry activity 
um, to slips that are a little bit more south and then open up additional open space to the north. So it really is a kind of crucial um, site and advancing those conversations are something that's really a priority for us in these next phases of work. Um, and so, of course, we want to do that with your input um, in mind and also hopefully your support. You can hear me with my palms cheering at that. <laughs> Great. And then the next slide, we're almost at the end. Thank you all for hanging in with us. Oh, no, we're not. We're going to Ronnie Dietz. <laughs> Energy and very important topic. <laughs> Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. All right. So just shifting gears, um, I'm excited to introduce a new work stream to this project on energy and sustainability. Uh, this work stream is really about how we can make the project site sustainable and contribute to broader city and state sustainability ambitions. Um, so I'll just talk through super briefly um, what we're beginning to look at as we unpack this work stream. Um, but really, fundamentally, it's so critical that we don't make the threat that we are trying to protect Lower Manhattan from worse in the process. Um, and as we are embarking on this journey of thinking about the, the intersection of climate adaptation with sustainability, we really are open to all of your ideas and suggestions of things that you would also want to see um, as part of this design. So if we go to the next slide. So the FIDIC Seaport Climate Resilience Plan is committed to advancing city and statewide sustainability targets, um, most notably reducing carbon emissions 80% by 2050. And to support this broader goal, we've developed three project-specific goals, and, and those are shown on the slide here. Um, so the first is that the plan should strive to be carbon neutral through both the construction and operations phases. Um, we also want to test new and emerging sustainability and energy practices for wider deployment elsewhere in the city. We recognize um, how just visible this site is in the broader context and making sure that we use that opportunity to showcase energy and sustainability and think about how it can be a role model elsewhere. Um, and to that point, also knowing that the plan should showcase its sustainability features in both visible and educational ways. Um, so, as we look to incorporate these three goals into the design, we're examining this through two questions, which are shown in that call out um, on the, the master plan graphic. So, the first is thinking about how we can reduce the project's overall carbon footprint um, that's both embodied and operating, or the carbon that goes into, say, constructing the site, as well as operating and maintaining the site. Um, but then more broadly, how we can contribute to human and ecological well being through the design. So thinking holistically about what it means to be a sustainable site. Um, and we believe that the 5 IC Port Climate Resilience Plan through these lenses has an opportunity to not only be a city and state leader, uh, but also a global leader at really that intersection between resiliency and sustainability. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So this is a very high level look at um, the toolkit of opportunities that we're considering to reduce both that embodied and operating carbon. Um, so on the embodied carbon side, so that's the, the first pillar of the puzzle, um, we're looking at opportunities for lower carbon material selections um, and also thinking about how we can source materials locally to minimize the distance that they need to travel um, before they get on site. Um, so, for example, we're thinking about can we reuse glass as part of a glass puzzle and concrete mix um, that could help to take uh, resource circularity to the next level and taking something that's local and in our waste stream and thinking about how we can use it to overall offset uh, the project's carbon footprint. And then those other three columns are on the operating carbon side. And this is how we're looking at how we can really use clean energy on site. Um, so that can be solar energy, um, how we can potentially store energy on site. Uh, and then we can also just think about holistically, how do we reduce demand for energy and that comes with making the site as efficient as possible. Um, so as we're thinking about the new ferry terminals, amenity buildings, um, and really the overall performance of the site, um, our team is really tasked with thinking about how we can look to best practices to make these new systems and these new buildings as energy efficient as possible. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I think uh, this is the last one. Um, just wanted to note that this is really the start of energy and sustainability in this work stream. Um, and there are a few things that we're continuing to do um, to understand what it means to be carbon neutral. Uh, so the first is we're working on developing an energy baseline study. So we're right now in the thick of calculating and understanding 
what is the energy usage of the site? Uh, what is the energy usage of the proposal? And what are different strategies that we can begin to take to minimize that carbon footprint? Um, we're also looking at integrating energy and sustainability further into our design studies. Uh, so Matt hit on a lot of these tonight, and we're really trying to intersect even more, say, with stormwater management or thinking about um, how we can reuse rainwater um, as part of an irrigation system for the site. Uh, urban heat island, which I think is hitting really close to home when we think about the temperatures all around the United States right now and the role of trees and other types of strategies to just minimize um, what it feels like when it's 105 degrees. Um, and then also overall energy footprint reduction studies. Uh, so one that we've heard a lot about, um, but curious other thoughts would be low carbon ferry provisions. Um, and we'll continue to document this in what's called a sustainability management plan. Um, starting to document this also gives us the opportunity to down the line pursue certifications, whether that's Envision, Sites, LEED, or other. Um, and then lastly, as we continue to advance in the design, further exploring material sourcing. So I know I mentioned that one example on um, glass in the waste stream and thinking about uh, how that could potentially be part of like a composite for concrete, um, but thinking even more just about where we can find local materials um, and where we can be thinking about innovative ways um, in order to construct the site. Uh, so we'll come back um, at future CB1 meetings with updates here, um, but welcome any early thoughts that folks may have. And Alexis, I think I pass it back to you for implementation now. Okay. Believe it or not, this is a consolidated version of this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you heard from us tonight on, on the design updates um, and the energy and sustainability goals and work streams. I just want to also mention that at the same time, we are advancing uh, all work streams having to do with the implementability of this project, which is also very important. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, um, uh, we'll be coming back at later sessions to kind of talk about these three major categories, which are regulatory, construction, which includes cost estimates, phasing, and also how we're advancing our funding and financing strategies. Um, we have made significant progress in this phase um, and have kind of milestones, benchmarks that we want to achieve for the next couple of phases. Next slide. Next steps, you can go ahead to, um, so we of course have a bunch of meetings coming up. Um, uh, I will in particularly shout out that we uh, are planning an open house for late September. Um, it will likely be two sessions to make sure that we have both a daytime session and an evening session. This is a really great public moment for the project where we're trying to get kind of the broadest audience and um, we'll be uh, uh, relying on kind of the advice of our CCLM co-chairs and members of CB1 to really help us um, in both developing the content and then also getting the word out. Um, we should have those dates secured hopefully by the end of this week, so we will start publicizing it. Um, and again, would be very open to kind of input on, on the overall content of that openness. Busy months and holidays. We have avoided those. That was uh, one of the first. Yes. I think we can also. Diana always. She's good back. as a first check. Make sure there's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank <laughs> so Here, I can all the yeah, we're going to do whole second day. Yeah, or I'll be very efficient, and I'm yeah, not nice, so it's it's good. <laughs> 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 Great. So, uh, my name is Patty Palmina. I'm the senior director of capital projects and resiliency at the Battery Park City Authority. I'm joined here by Nick Cordon, who everyone knows, our VP of communications, um, public affairs, and also 
joining us virtually is Glenn Dawson, our senior VP of Real Property. Um, we're going to start first um, with a brief update. I know we have a second item on the Northwest project, so I'll keep this pretty straightforward. Um, right now on the Northwest project, we, received, uh, we reached our 30% design milestone um, in June for, for the majority of these seven reaches that we're working on. Uh, there are several areas that we're still working on development, among them reach five and reach one, uh, which the knows. Um, our drawings are currently under review with all the agencies having jurisdiction for comment. Uh, that began in June and will continue through August. Um, so we're waiting on those comments. We also have uh, public comments that we're currently um, taking in from both the meeting on June 26, but also we have our comment board that is still open. Um, next slide, please. One in August. Oh, one in August for the agency review. Oh, the close of comments is being extended for the for those, which one we'll, we'll talk a bit about. Um, but yes, the agency comments are August, just to be clear. Um, so just some views. So this is um, by the Winter Garden and at Waterford Plaza in North Cove. Um, just to show that the FBS wall is closer to the restaurant and along um, right in front of the Winter Garden area. Next slide. We also have these materials on our website if you'd like to do a deeper dive. This is a view of the South Esplanade at the south corner by the Regatta. Um, just looking north where we have a meandering path, which is currently within 30% design. And here we're utilizing the FBS, uh, the privacy walls that are existing as the FBS system. So there's no parties. So okay, I just wanted to be mindful of like, yeah, there's, like does this if you have a chance to see. Sure, I'm sorry. I, again, I just want to be mindful that there's a lot to cover. So. There's a lot of work here. So. Yeah, and so this is just a view um, of South Cove. Uh, to the right is the Regatta building where we're currently um, working on. Um, what the flood protection system would look like here, um, just given the fact that it has to be slightly higher given the exposure in the area. Um, we have other materials, including fly throughs of these areas, again on our website. Um, next slide, please. I will go slower. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this is just an overview of uh, the public engagement we've done on the project to date. Um, like, as I said, we had a 30% design meeting on June 26th. Uh, we had a great turnout. We did a virtual option and also an in-person option. Uh, we have a virtual board, which I did not put the address on here, but I believe you have. I can share it again. If you don't have it, uh, where the public can review all the materials and leave comments. Um, and right now, we're also um, reviewing all the comments we got at the meeting and basically developing responses to them. We got quite a lot, over 100 comments uh, from the public meeting. Um, so moving on to the South project. Next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, so here's where we are. So the construction for the MJH and Wagner site work is currently underway. Um, the phase two, which is the puree and battery work, we have a contractor on board. The expected start of that uh, contractor work is in the fall, most likely September of this year. Uh, we're working on getting a finalized schedule. And as soon as we have that definite start date, we'll be coordinating with the board just to give you a heads up um, and providing information. We also have uh, bi weekly construction it updates that go out. Uh, we have a dedicated email address for the project that people can sign up for those updates. Um, and I believe that our construction liaison for the project also goes to the monthly district service cabinet meetings and provides updates there as well. Uh, next slide, please. This is just an update on what sort of happened um, since the last time we came to the quarterly update. So uh, the fencing obviously is up. If you've been by the site, you've seen that. Um, that is the Wagner and the MJH fencing. Um, so the demolition and clearing the project site has been ongoing. The pick the visual on the left uh, is just taken from last week behind the Museum of Jewish Heritage. The uh, section in the middle is of Wagner Park. And then the right shows uh, the pile driver, which just came on site last week where they're doing test piles right now um, before they start them in earnest. Again, the pavilion piles will be starting uh, towards the end of this month, which we're already here. I don't know how we got here and continue through August. Um, we're doing test pits around first place. That coordination is ongoing with Con Edison uh, because we have vaults there. Um, so that work will be taking place in the coming weeks. Do you have what there? Mm -hmm. uh, we have Con Ed vaults along first place. And then the installation of the sheet pile uh, for the flood wall in Wagner Park is going to be taking place next month into September. So a lot of work is happening on site. Um, next slide, please. And this is just any information uh, that people would like about the project. Rick Fogarty is our community construction liaison. This is his direct phone number. He's incredibly responsive. This is our project email box. It is monitored. 
um, feel free to reach out. And again, if you'd like to sign up for any updates, this is how you can do that. Um, and I believe that is the last of my update. I think I'm handing it off to the battery coastal. Team. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Nelson. Um, I'm project manager for the LMCR battery project from uh, New York City EDC. Um, we're joined here by Kathleen Chan, who's also VP from EDC, as well as Patrick Prime, who is the construction manager from Hunter Roberts, uh, who will be overseeing construction for this project. Um, and then our counterparts from Parks, uh, Mike Bradley is also uh, on the call as well. Um, so just a quick update. Um, we are complete with design. Um, we are uh, doing some, uh, going through some permitting uh, right now, and we are also out for uh, procurement, um, and we should be onboarding some of our contractors in the next few months. Um, so I will turn it over to Patrick. From, uh, Patrick Prime with Hunter Harvest Construction Group. As Steve said, we're the construction managers on the project. Um, we're just going to give a, a brief overview on kind of what we've done since the last time we were here, uh, since the last time we met, what we have coming up in the coming months uh, through the end of the year, and then kind of retouching on our plans for the, the two phases of the LMCR battery project. Um, so since we last met, uh, we had completed the substructure work on slips one and two of the existing wharf for use by, or so those slips are able to be used by Statue Cruz National Parks. We've completed some fender upgrades there. Um, so when time comes, the, the Statue Cruz boats will be able to dock safely at those two slips. Um, additionally, we performed some early salvage um, in that pink area down on the right um, by the view restaurant of granite and wood material that are gonna eventually be processed and reused in the uh, overall resiliency project. Uh, we did that work to get out ahead of the interim tent roof or interim tent construction by National Park Service, which started in July. Um, and then we also just set up a small staging area at the southern end of the oval. Um, all right, next slide, please. So, yeah, so this slide shows basically the time frame from July to the end of the year. Um, the major activity ongoing during this time is the National Park Service construction of their interim tent over by the View Restaurant. Um, as part of this effort, uh, the whole battery team has been working closely with National Park Service, but also the various stakeholders in the project. Um, we've had several site meetings with both the View Restaurant and the Conservancy to kind of walk through what the impacts of this work will be, but also to try and mitigate some of the, their concerns um, for this process. Um, and then additionally, we're, we're actually meeting with them later this week uh, to have a, a kickoff prior to starting foundation work for this, uh, this tent. Uh, the tent work's gonna start, or it started and gonna be running through November, at which point the National Park Service will be starting to, they'll, they'll start to kind of transfer their operations from the existing tent uh, right by Castle Clinton over to um, the interim tent and just kind of start their operation out of that interim tent in December of this year. Um, some other things going on during this time is, as Claudia had mentioned, the start of the South Battery Park uh, project along uh, Battery Place. And then um, the water taxi will be demobilizing in November uh, ahead of uh, the phase one construction. Um, all right, well, the next slide, please. So then in December of this year, uh, we'll be mobilizing for our, our site setup for the phase one, which is the, the pink area, uh, basically from the East Coast Memorial down to the Pier A Plaza. Um, 
December, January timeframe will be site set up and then also salvaging of all the existing granite and then timber material that's scheduled for reuse uh, ahead of um, the mobile, uh, ahead of the uh, mobilization of our marine contractor in January uh, next year. Um, our marine contract will be out there for about a year from January next year to January 2025. And then we'll have uh, our parks finishes wrapping up in March of 2025. Um, in March of 2025, the National Park Service will begin their reconstruction of their tent um, in the back in the area around Castle Clinton. Um, and then with the eventual kind of turning over of their operations to the newly rebuilt wharf in June of 25, uh, a couple other projects ongoing uh, again the South Barry Park City project will be continuing. There's a DOT resiliency project going to start during this time frame and then the uh, parks um, field house renovation over by the playground that'll be ongoing. Uh, and one thing we just wanted to touch on again was all the coordination efforts with both the Battery Park City team and then the Battery Conservancy and it's kind of all the different items in the park that we've moved around some storage areas. Uh, we worked our access to the park to, to try and keep those open for the public during the duration of this uh, construction, kind of limiting our footprint as much as possible. Um, next slide, please. So then this, this last slide, which is captures the time period from July to July 25 to June 26, is our, our second phase of the LMCR battery. Um, we'll be mobilizing uh, again site setup and salvage in uh, July of 25 um, with our marine contractor filing shortly there behind it. Um, that marine work will probably be going, the heavy marine work will probably be going until around Jan or March of 25 with the park finishes finishing in, in June of 26. Um, at this point, uh, everything is shown in the, the green will be open to the public um, and we'll have our footprint kind of minimized to the area um, on the eastern end of the wharf by the view restaurant. Um, next slide. And then just wanted to um, get this back out here, but our, we have our project website with information and then any any questions we can send emails to the our uh, project email address for. Now we're off to uh, Sam is, is on the line, our manager on the, the BMCR to, to provide an update on that work. Sam, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Folks, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This is Sam Scazzari, and I'm the project manager for the Brooklyn Bridge to Montgomery Street Coastal Resilience Project. Uh, I am an extension of DDC construction staff, and I work for the firm, uh, the joint venture of Jacobs GPI here in New York City, and uh, am assigned full time to the project. I'm filling in for the community engagement folks tonight, both of which are are out sick. Uh, that would be Parker McClure and uh, Desiree um, Galvez, I believe. So let's um, let me just run you through some status, and uh, I thank you all for for giving me this this uh, little bit of time with you today. Uh, next slide, please. We're going to run through project status, uh, a little bit of the project timeline, Esplanade access information and community resources information. Next slide. Here we have uh, three photographs of some current status taking place on the BMCR project. Uh, for those of you, I, I'm sure you all know, but just to recap, uh, it's a series of flood walls uh, running uh, parallel to the bulkhead uh, under the FDR drive. And then there's some street work in South Street uh, for parallel conveyance and upgrade to utilities associated with that. The bottom left hand photographed is uh, 
excavation work for the footing of the uh, flip up gates section of the flood wall system. And uh, we're looking in an area there, which I believe is near Rutgers uh, and uh, near Pike, uh, Pike and Rutgers. Uh, actually, it's right across from the intersection. Uh, we have a water main removal photograph in the center. Now there's an existing water main uh, that will be underneath the foundation for the flip up gates flip -up and gate. that and that's uh, an abandoned water main. So that's why that's being removed. And then the photograph on the right is installation of new Con Ed gas main in South Street uh, along the sidewalk on the what would be the southbound side of South Street. Um, Coming up in the near future, we'll be installing micro piles for the flood walls. Uh, the micro piles are a series of foundation pilings that will be underneath the foundation to the flood wall. And then seepage barrier excavation and then jet grouting. Seepage barrier is underneath the flood wall and prevents the flood wall from experiencing buoyancy uh, in the event of a storm and there's say under ground water surge passing underneath the wall, that seepage barrier will block that and shift that force to a different location. Currently, we're coordinating with our other two resilience projects that are in uh, construction at this point, the parallel conveyance and the uh, PA1 construction projects, which are part of um, the ESCR effort. Uh, their utility work is taking place at Montgomery Street right now, uh, and it overlaps our work, um, but we are coordinating together. And we coordinate with DOT, of course, and parks to maintain a safe greenway access. Um, I'll explain a little more about that on the next slide. Now, in uh, 2023, earlier this year, we started a test pit program and we're able to begin some of the distribution water main work taking place in South Street. And we have just begun, as you saw on the previous slide, photographs of Con Ed utility work taking place. The Con Ed work uh, will move their existing facilities out of the way of where the new trunk main and parallel conveyance for this project need to take place. Coming uh, later this year is uh, interceptor gate chamber work and sewer capacity improvements. Uh, we've just started the flood wall and floodgates work by some of the excavation for the footings. And we're starting to do some work up uh, near the Brooklyn Bridge, but not adjacent to the historic structure, but adjacent to an FDR drive southbound off ramp where the flood wall ties in. And then you'll see uh, in 2024, the new trunk water main in South Street taking place. And then our restoration to both South Street and the Esplanade, which will, uh, the Esplanade will be a world-class open space. Uh, will start to begin in late 2025 and uh, complete at the end of the project uh, in late 2026. Um, next slide. Here's a plan view of the project that demonstrates and illustrates where the uh, greenway was relocated over the last, uh, say, couple of weeks. Um, on June 19th, we relocated the greenway from along the northbound side of South Street to the bulkhead and then back to the northbound side of South Street closer to Pier 35, as you can see in the map. Um, the shared pedestrian path will always have access to each cross street. So you'll have a 20 foot wide, and we do have a 20 foot wide access from Catherine Slip, Market Slip, Pike Slip, Rutgers Slip, and then uh, across from Pier 35 so that there's always emergency access as well as public access to the waterfront. And fortunately, our contractor found a way to uh, give additional real estate to this area so that in some areas we have up to 17 feet wide along the railing on the bulkhead so that there's more uh, maneuverable space for
bike traffic as well as pedestrian traffic and continued pedestrian use of the railing area, the step down area, and uh, just recreational open space. Um, Pier 42 amenities uh, include basketball half courts, a soccer field, tennis courts, and exercise equipment. And we're hoping uh, that will do some of the mitigation of what we lost in this area. Uh, as you know, in order to build the wall, we had to take away uh, the public space part of the esplanade, which housed a lot of exercise equipment um, and other kinds of open space amenities for the public. So Pier 42 will hopefully mitigate that to some extent, and then we'll expeditiously, uh, ex expeditiously get this project complete so that um, they can have it back and uh, in its new and improved state. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, you can visit us at our website at nyc.gov slash bmcr. Uh, Marcia Guido, who's on our on the call tonight, uh, can be reached. She's our community construction liaison and is involved with everything from water main shutdowns to overall information uh, to the public when requested. Um, we do tabling in the community. Uh, we attend the CB uh, Community Board 3 Parks meetings. We have a newsletter available, um, on-site signage, and coming soon will be an inquiry tool uh, where folks will be able to log on and, and ask questions and, and get the answers they need. So with that, I'll wrap up. If uh, anybody has any questions, uh, I'll stay on the line and Marsha's here with me as well, and we'll we'll provide you with what you need to know. So thank you. And that's the final update from the Seaport Social Engineering team. I believe that's Kathleen uh, from uh, Thank you, George. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Sam. You want to wrap up here? No, I'm sorry. I thought Jordan was speaking to me and I couldn't quite make it out. But um, I know. Thank you, everybody. And please feel free to reach out to us uh, for anything you need. Thank you, Sam. Uh, can we go to the seaport? Okay. Thank you, Jordan. So the last project, I think, on the agenda is an update on the seaport coastal resilience project. Uh, we are happy to say we are towards the, the end of the procurement process to bring a design team on board. Uh, we know this is a very special unique in terms of resilience. Um, it is a historic um, district and it's got a lot more special attention and nuances to, to really preserving the neighborhood. Oh, I'm sorry, Jordan. Oh, I'm sorry, Jordan. Sorry. You can keep on going. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, we know this is a much more unique area in terms of resilience because of its historic nature. It's going to be um, more complicated in terms of um, really community engagement. Uh, a lot of very diverse uh, stakeholders, uh, business owners. There, there are a lot of folks who come to this neighborhood. And, and in this area, uh, it's going to be extremely challenging. It's a very old neighborhood. It's one of the lowest lying area of the resiliency projects. But uh, we're real with the design team the design by a lot of the unique cha challenges. And we're very excited to get someone on board, um, hopefully in the next um, so really start the process and really start to engage the community and really start to dig into trying to make this area resilient for the future. Oh, and just um, a couple of more updates. The brick award has been formally received from FEMA and we have already started to engage with uh, FEMA. Dishes from New York State is actually managing this particular grant and we have already started to do the review process and the tracking of the project with um, with dishes. Um, so we're very, very excited to, to get going with this particular resiliency project. 
Perfect. Jordan. Thanks, Kat. Great. So we've reached the end. Thank you for, for bearing with us. Uh, our final two slides, uh, just to, to give you a sense, you know, how all these projects are moving forward. Uh, once again, uh, I think it was, uh, at least for me, exciting to see how many of these projects have gone from uh, renderings to actual construction photos. I, you know, there were moments where we didn't think this was going to happen. Um, so, once again, Brooklyn Bridge to Montgomery under construction, uh, South Battery Park City under construction, uh, Battery Coast Resilience early stages of construction. Uh, our, our next efforts, uh, Northwest uh, and uh, advancing 30% uh, design, uh, Seaport Coastal Resilience in the middle of the RFP process, uh, so a little bit further uh, behind. And you know, I think once again, the, the finance Seaport Master Plan is a, is a, is a different beast. Uh, 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 you know, I, I think in many ways is, is is very good and allows for the community board to provide a lot of feedback on the design, uh, but it's it's unique. Uh, it's uh, kind of a, a whole other scale of challenge. Uh, so we'll be a, a, a bit of a longer process. And if we go to the, the final slide, uh, you can see here, uh, once again, a number of these projects uh, are, are in uh, ongoing uh, are in construction. So there will be ongoing construction updates, uh, BMC of the Battery and, and, and South Battery Park City. Uh, uh, the Northwest project uh, uh, has just uh, finished a, a series of, of updates. Uh, and so there will be uh, new timing on, on uh, their, their updates going in the fall. We'll be hearing from them shortly. Uh, Seaport, uh, once we have the uh, team on board, uh, we'll give you dates uh, for design workshops and this year going next. Uh, and and find a Seaport, uh, know where to find us. Uh, we uh, uh, really leaned into kind of all different types of engagement, uh, walking tours, workshops, Individual free things, uh, and as mentioned before, have a uh, a, a larger uh, public meeting scheduled uh, for the end of September, and we will do our best to avoid all holidays and uh, any CD1 meetings. Uh, and so, with that, I will get back on to the chair. Oh, boy. <laughs> Big thank you. That's a really Herculean effort on all your part. I really appreciate the extraordinary presentation. A little bit much. <laughs> To take in in one, uh, you know, fell swoop. Obviously, we're going to have to do that, and then begin to look at this, and then, so all of you said, go down on each separate aspect. So, um, I think for tonight, given, um, well, I, I will say a big thank you. I will say that the battery presentation and the seaport um, resilience. That has to come. That's kind of stayed pretty much the same as what we've seen before. We'll look forward to having the sort of next iteration to really make comments. So I, I think we can leave that out unless there are questions. Of course, that has to come back to us with much more detail, particularly battery. I have a million questions on that. It would be great to really drill down. So maybe we can work out a date with you all, um, Steve and such, to to figure that out sooner than later in the in the early fall. So maybe tonight it seems and battery. Uh, Brooklyn Montgomery, uh, very helpful, of course, on the edge of our two community boards, three and two, uh, excuse me, three and one. What would be really helpful there is to ask that you um, and the LCR come together to really talk about that joint, you know, and particularly vis a vis what's going to go on in Gotham Park and that whole area, because it's really that connection. It's a little unclear. So at some point, if that could be arranged, that would be. It's like Rosa has supported your. Oh, <laughs> I'm looking at a screen there. Thanks, Rosa. Um, swell, because I think we really want to know that. I, I know you've heard all about that. So that will be another follow up. All of this will be followed up, but those three are critical. And really, I'd say aren't there's not enough here to kind of drill down on. That said, I think the five IC port master plan, I know that Tammy and I had the privilege of seeing this earlier. Um, you know, there's a lot and Wendy, there's a lot here. Um, I think uh, that, you know, there's a good moment to kind of ask some questions and flesh out some thoughts. I know it's terrific. We, as everyone should remember, there will be this public presentation. I'm sure it'll be stellar again in September. Um, as a public meeting, so we will have an opportunity, of course, to follow up. But tonight is a time where the community's questions and concerns can be addressed on all these issues. But that one in particular seems to be the most fleshed out tonight. And then we'll move on to Battery Park City, where I think Gwen and um, Nick have a little more to tell us. So maybe do you want to do that afterwards, Nick? 
Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Let's ask all the questions. Okay, first. so why don't we start? So, okay, so let's start with the committee members' questions, concerns, comments. And I should say that we're not going to write a resolution tonight. And that's thanks to Diana, um, you know, confirming my own thoughts on this, which is to wait until it kind of sinks in, wait until that public meeting in the fall to really. You know, there's a million parts to this, of course. So there's going to be a lot that we're going to want as a community and a committee board to obviously reflect on. So I think we'll wait on that. So tonight will not be the night for the resolution. That said, I'd appreciate that everyone makes sure that the comments that if you're not making them here, you email the board, CB1 board, and highlight Environmental Protection Committee, you know, Seaport Resilience, or whatever your comments and concerns are, so we can compile these. When we go ahead and do the resolution in the fall. So, with that said, I'd love to open it up to the committee first and then the general folks that have attended. Um, if any thoughts have come to mind, questions you have. And, and Rose's hand is still up, so I don't know if that. Well, we'll get to her own yeah. um, first. No, no, it's totally time. fine. I just. Uh, just based, seems based hand on what you based on what you said uh, earlier, so that's yeah. all good. And oh, okay. Okay. So, so the yeah. room first, and then I'm yeah. Those people who who slept here have to go first to every house. Okay, so that's Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff Gallup. Um, you said uh, this is regarding the Finai Seaport Master Plan, and one of the speakers mentioned there have been some developments on funding. Um, and, and so I'd like to drill down a little bit. And, and one question I have, I'm, I'm assuming federal funding is going to be required given the magnitude of the price tag that you've talked about in the past, a multi-billion dollar price tag. To what extent is the funding that you're contemplated tied up with what would be the HAS funding the, from, the, from the Army Corps and related, relatedly, to what extent is your funding dependent upon Congress approving uh, some HATS project? And we all know the timeline uh, of that. I'm trying to get an idea, but really, at the end of the day, the timeline for yep. the project being built and the reasonable expectation that it ever will be built. <laughs> because the wonderful design work being right. done, but it's quite a big price tag for the, for the yeah. actual construction. Do you want me to I'll speak to the funding and then you can perhaps speak to the timeline? Yeah, so um, in even as dating back to the master plan, when we kind of had these early financial and funding projections, um, we identified that the Army Corps Civil Works program is the single largest pot of money for these types of projects. So even as we have been um, very successful in identifying kind of FEMA brick grants, and I will say very ambitious in uh, making sure that we're really on top of the other federal grants that are all in the pipeline, and, and Jordan can speak to that, um, those are still capped at certain amounts. Uh, whereas, uh, again, the, the Civil Works program functions through kind of an appropriation for a much larger amount that then is met um, through kind of a, a local match. No matter what, we're going to need large federal funding, a large amount of federal funding. Um, and uh, even to make that state and local match, um, uh, uh, we need to be identifying sources um, beyond just kind of taxpayer dollars um, in order to make sure that we can make up um, that, that gap. Um, so again, we we continue to identify the Civil Works program as the largest potential funding source, and um, want to make sure that that door remains open through very close coordination, obviously with the Army Corps, not not just district, but also headquarters. And would you expect the congressional authorization, if you were successful in that funding, to be basically part of the same uh, appropriation that would? Otherwise, be going with the, the hats, the rest of the hat study, and would this be sort of integrated within that as what hats is going to cover for this segment as designed by you guys, as opposed to by the Army Corps of Engineers? So there are multiple pathways forward, mm -hmm. but I think given that the hats study has already been authorized as a study, um, it would make sense that we strongly pursue that it that then FIDA Seaport be included as part of that appropriation. Um, the problem is if you don't take that path, and again, there are multiple pathways, but we would have to go back, be reauthorized as a study separate from that. It, and it's a very complicated process that I can say is we're only just 
starting to really untangle. Um, but I think the the idea that we've identified that as such a large pot of funding that could be compatible with what we see is kind of our community driven vision means that we need to continue those conversations and, with, and keep that that door open. And in terms of timeline, does that mean that your sort of best case is to follow what we've been talking about in terms of the Army Corps timeline that 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 one. You know, authorization and appropriation as opposed to starting the process and adding multiple years or whenever Congress is going to get around to the next large appropriation under that program. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, that's a, a kind of um, mayor's office decision. Um, I think they're very closely following the timeline. Um, uh, there are ways in which it could align with when we actually need the capital construction. Um, funds, but again, um, I don't know, Jordan, if you want to speak to kind of, uh, there's obviously a lot more than just this five day C court. Um, so I'm really only speaking to it kind of from that, that project perspective. No, that's, that's completely accurate. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is a unique project and there aren't, uh, a deep set of, of funding opportunities in the same way. You know, I think there was a the great news on. The gateway project and the 6.9 billion dollars they were able to get out of I can't remember it was mega kind of one of the larger transportation funding. There is simply not a bucket of transfer of, of resiliency dollars uh, that could have the city state you know, municipality construct. It is very much connected with working with the Army Corps. So I think that is her, her point. Uh, a, a pathway, an intriguing pathway, um, but I, I think we don't want to uh, put all of our eggs in that basket. Thank you. Great question. Anybody else on the finance question who wants to tease that out? I have like a follow up to that. Is it then competing with the since this is a well developed project that will be, you know, not quite shovel ready, but pretty close versus what's north of Battery Park along the Hudson River Park? That's that's what we consider the hat study. Most of us consider the hat study area. Does that mean that these two projects would compete with each other then? I, I don't want to speak for the Army Corps or the congressional process, but I, I think you know there will be the overall portfolio said to be I think it's 52, 54 billion dollars. And so I think it will depend on on what eventually gets uh, authorized and then appropriated. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a, a competition. I think that the idea is that the states and, and cities would go after a kind of a full appropriation. Other questions in the room on any aspect of the project? Wow. No, I, I have a question. You mentioned there's going to be a whole environmental review process. Can you please just briefly yeah. go? Is that the CICRA? Um... Um, so it is um, multiple levels, but essentially it follows the NEPA process. So when you're accepting any federal dollars, um, you need to comply with NEPA. Um, as part of that, uh, we will also be complying with all the kind of state and, and local requirements, but the guiding um, uh, kind of overall is, is the, the NEPA process. What is NEPA? It's the National, oh, someone said it. Uh, <laughs> National Environmental <laughs> Protection <laughs> Act. Okay. Yeah. So that, I had to think about it for a second. <laughs> yeah. And that adds on a layer of um, review and, um, input. and community input. Yeah. And... yeah, so it has built in um, community input, review milestones. I think these are all things that really kind of the city does just because of mm -hmm. the nature of kind of the level of community engagement. Um, but it, they're kind of like, it, it's, you know, legal statutes, which say, um, you know, you need to release a draft, you need to release um, uh, an opportunities for community input. And then all the other federal agencies, whether they're cooperating agencies or reviewing agencies also have an opportunity to review it. Yeah, so all that has to be factored into that timeline. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go after everybody online. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so, Colin, I think I saw from Tammy's text that you had something that was related. Go ahead, Colin Mahoney. Welcome. Yeah. Hey, guys. Just really quickly, what's what's the third party review process of this for major engineering firms? Or I know there's an easy answer to this, but I'm just curious. I'm just curious. 
how do we actually know that this would work? I think we lost audio here. I think we lost audio. You were lit up for a minute, but no. See your mouth going, but no words. All right. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Just talk loudly. Um, so, uh, a construction management firm um, will be brought on. Um, uh, in the case of this project, we'll, we'll probably bring them on, um, engage them even earlier um, uh, than other projects might, um, in particular to review, a, do a kind of QA, QC of uh, this phase of work in the engineering. Um, so, yes, we will, we will be engaging a construction management firm. It's a little bit of a misnomer because we're not going to construction. And they're entirely removed from the process. They're, again, they're independent. And they can review the plans and tell us if simply put if it's going to work or not. Yes, yes. We okay. review the kind of conflict of interest. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. Um, oh, Just sorry. Sorry. And Wendy had Wendy oh, was I'll get to everybody, not to worry. <laughs> um, so um in your design, some of the in the transportation committee we talked about last mile delivery yeah. and those kinds of things. Are you thinking about the blue way and logistics in your plan? I didn't see that yeah. indicated anywhere. So. No, we absolutely are, and it just wasn't a, a topic of tonight's um, update. Uh, but uh, fortunately, at EDC, our transportation group is actually very closely involved in and in, in some of those studies, the last mile delivery um, and micro freight. And so um, we have multiple touch points with the designers. We're in particular, we're building in the flexibility to make sure that you know those uses can be incorporated in in the future. As I said, right now we're really about the footprint and kind of reserving space. Um, so, a lot of it's just understanding the needs of that future program and making sure we can incorporate it. Okay, and then the last thing is the heliport. Construction, are we foreseeing a much more. Active heliport in the sustainability, I think her name was Bronnie, uh -huh. uh, you know, they're now have sustainable aviation fuels. So. Yep. If we are going to develop that. Yeah. Despite the noise and all of the other issues that come with it, um, that that be required to be a green fuel. Issue. Um, I, I, it, it, you know, our overall goals include some transportation um, goals. I can't speak to the immediate plans on the heliport. I think Diana, you would need to get back to them after. I, I just don't, I, I don't work on that. Yeah, there are a lot of federal regulations. There's a lot that's dictated by law um, when we're talking about use specifically. But of course, um, with the sustainability plus or resiliency plus um, really focused on when we're talking about um, the evolving technology and incorporating as much green energy as we can. Of course, that's a focus. And we'll be seeking to do that as much as we can. I want to tag okay. um, to Okay, go ahead. Um, one of the tags when we were talking when they presented about here and the changes between phase four and phase five in terms of the pedestrian access, it was mentioned that it was a concern for safety and security about having the walkway um, attached to the pier that was for pier six, the heliport. Um, that was one of the reasons why the redevelopment out from having the band out front and in the ecological pushed back to the landscape, which brings me to a concern that when we talk about blue highways, last mile delivery and access to Pier 6, which is what has been presented as the potential use for things other than the heliport on that pier, that that actually would not be possible if we can't have a walkway that goes by the pier and connects to the pier um, for security reasons, then how will any of those potential uses be able to be used? And what is the backup plan if it is not based on that dialogue? Right? Yeah, so I may need a clarification on this question because I believe when Matt spoke to the um, security concerns, it was for the portion that was the um, uh, a little bit farther north, or am I? It, 
Yeah, I think, I think, I we're, think it we're was kind of mixing two concerns. Yeah, yeah, I believe that that wasn't near the. It was the, the connections pier six. It was that space, six. I thought. In between. Uh, there were two adjustments to the Esplanade. Um, mm -hmm. The first adjustment further south, which was the removal of the Esplanade at the lower level at pier six. The second change um, was the adjustment of a detached Esplanade to an attached Esplanade. And um, your question is more specifically about the heliport access, correct? No, you mentioned that the lower portion was deemed not safe to be connected to Pier 6 right. from a security standpoint. And so my question is, if it's not secure to have pedestrians there, how would we be able to get a blue highway used last mile delivery and the other concepts that have been forecasted right. as potentials on that pier? So um, the access to the pier will be actually through a gate underneath the elevated landscape directly to the pier. So um, we have to provide access to the heliport um, regardless for uh, riders, uh, fueling trucks, emergency access. And that, that access will happen uh, through a floodgate underneath the elevated landscape directly up to the pier. That's probably, it's a little hard to explain just with my hands. Um, but you tell, sorry to interrupt. Can we get Lauren? Lauren, are you still with us to perhaps bring up yeah. one of the pages that you might yeah. have never had before? Yeah, you yeah. It, it would be. You could just hit that. Yeah. You can just tell us which page of the presentation Lauren can bring that back. I think page 25 might have had something. I'm not sure. Maybe my page numbers are a little different, but oh. yeah. Or page 27. Um, left two I can tell you in a moment. Yeah. No, she didn't. Oh, sorry, Lauren. It's a long way back. Yeah, it is there a very long way back. Really so is that, there it is right there. Isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah, no, I think that's a. Yeah, this will work. work. This, in terms of access, I think this will work. Yeah, so um, the dash line in the bottom left. So the previous plan, um, there's a lower level esplanade that really ended at the heliport mm -hmm. on that lower level. Um, because once you go further south, you can see in the image that we have a ferry terminal and you can't have a lower level esplanade at the ferry terminal. And so what that created was really a dead end esplanade that happened at that pier. Um, it's a multi level waterfront, so there's a public space that's up higher. Um, that uh, really just appears down here and then the upper level um, public upper level space just moves along. So um, that that dead end esplanade um, was a security concern because it would it would end right at where we have the heliport landing area. So we have an upper level esplanade that's perfectly public and then there's an access tunnel underneath the elevated landscape that would provide access to that um, to the heliport, whether it's and used in the future for um, for last mile freight or or the heliport uses itself, we would obviously have access to that to that pier. Right. I have another question. For All right. All right. Okay. okay. Uh, let's go with Laura Starr. Hey, Laura. Hi. Hi. It's really great to see everybody, Jordan and Alexis and Diana and Carrie and Alice and everybody, Wendy. Um, so about so, access. I assume you guys are still holding the option of removing the FDR drive. Maybe you said this, but I missed it. Yeah, so it actually works with or without the FDR drive in the future. The master plan works in both cases. Right, but I know that. Is, is there any momentum for eliminating the FDR drive? That's a charting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is is always helpful to hear uh, um, comments like yours and, and kind of any resolution from the board. I know that uh, some of our uh, colleagues were out at a, a tabling event, and and Borough President uh, Levine dropped by and, and made a pitch for this exact issue. Um, you know, I, I think it is always yeah, good to hear things like that. I think from the perspective of uh, our office and, and EDC, this is a uh, as you can tell, incredibly complicated project on its own right. Uh, as many of you know, the, the DOT section there is, because it's elevated, is under state control. So I, I think, uh, you know, we want to move as fast as we can on, on, on what we can control. And 
you know, I can speak for the team and I think everyone who spent any time there, uh, I don't think any of us would be upset uh, uh, if, if there were changes contemplated that that asset is near the end of its, its useful life. So I think uh, hearing from the community board and, and keeping up the, the momentum uh, is, is, is critical. And so encourage comments like yours. I'm not so I know, Alice, I know Alice. I know that you know were. That you were uh, well, I know that we're going to make a resolution, and I also know that you were trying to put together this working group for the west side. The west side. Uh, and what I really think I really is think that there has been there just a complete revolution. Right. People cycling and jogging and walking along the waterfront. And we really have probably as many people wanting to do that down here as that use like the Central Park Drive or the Prospect Park Drive on a weekend. And we're confined to these measly, you know, thoroughfares for 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 people who are not in cars. And we have to shift that for, you know, for help. It's too congested and it has to happen along the west side and at FIDI, and I think the community board has to really fight for this, or, I mean, it, it's like a traffic jam in the mornings on the west side, also in Hudson River Park. There's not enough space for, for the joggers, the walkers, the people with the strollers, the bikes. So I, I just want to put a pitch in for the board for to the board advocate, advocate for, for um, people um, in the park. People in are, the Um, okay, Justine, oh, sorry. yeah, Justine, hi. Wait, you're not going to react? <laughs> okay. Uh, I react. Are we going to let them react to, to Laura? It's okay. I was going to, that's not my question, but I would think it's a great idea to have bike access like there used to be. I mean, it wasn't perfect, but there was bike access up the east side before the construction started and having wonderful bike access is really important. And whether that's with the FDR drive without it, I don't know, but. It should be as um, robust as it is on the west side, but as Laura pointed out, even on the west side, what, what's there is overcrowded already. And made worse, I think, because you can't get uptown now on the east side, not all the way. Everything is with construction. So I guess, I guess just to drive the point home more, like when I first started working in Central Park, there were cars on all the park cars on all the park trucks. And when, and when we were able to get the cars out of the park, it was a revolution for how people use the park. And I think we need to think big down here about trading out our vehicle, some of our vehicular infrastructure for these other greener uses. Okay, that's it, Alice. Um, I'll shut up, but I, but I would like to see this in our resolutions. And then I don't know if you were here for the part where I said we would be doing the resolution. We reserve this till after the public presentation is so we all had more time to kind of yeah on. I heard that but I still want to plant the seed because this is a really major idea and to Jordan's point Point. city needs the advocacy from the community in order to feel like they have the, the public support to make such a you know daring bold move so that's up that's on us a lot of I think two resolutions now and along with you know, our congressman support to, of course, set up the West Side Resiliency Task Force, something that Jordan has heard a great deal about over the years. And so that we are going to be pushing for that and continue to push it for that on the east side as well, in terms of the, the very conditions you're talking about in the FDR, which is also something this board opined on. We will take those resolutions out. We will, you know, absolutely follow through on them. I 100%. Right, because they, they involve the city and the state cooperating with each other. So that's that's kind of the point is that it's a it that's the point of the task force is to get this cross jurisdictional cooperation that can enable things to really happen. Okay, I'm I'm done. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Alice, may I ask my question? Yes. Ah. I, Matt, I can go. Thank you. So, um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for this thoughtful and design and presentation. It was extensive and a lot. 
But um, I want to focus on one thing, which was the, the very in the very beginning, there was a discussion that was this was around the maritime building and the battery maritime building. And I want to point out that there was a discussion about um, public space and new open public space. And I just want to remind this board that um, about 10 years ago, we were promised that the uh, battery maritime building was going to be public use and the inter interior of that building, especially the great hall, with its ma magnificent uh, Gustavano uh, tiles was going to be open to the public and that did not happen. And so what I just want to remind this board to do and pay attention to is what um, can be expected for the new iteration of what they're talking about down in that area and what um, uh, tools do we have besides the resolution or what promises can we enact or whatever it is to ensure this is going to be different this time. And that's my question. That's a good question, Justine, and I'd love to hear it because there is a major concern. We were promised last year um, there would be public programming and there was all kinds of plans. Nothing has come forward. There were no markets as promised. There's nothing. It is a privatized public yeah. asset that has not been changed. Um, I have my own on the presentation, on the building, on the plans for it, which um, you have heard me say before. I think that for taking away the Governor's Island Ferry to provide a pass-through to a concrete pier that by engineering commentary and maritime use would be highly improbable to use for historic ships due to the wave um, the issues with the waves of in and out ferries and other things that the design of what you've shown and the usage does not seem like it is actually very possible. Um, so it almost seems like a built out pier for the public to walk on to turn around and look at this beautiful privatized public asset without access. So building a pipe, a park in front of that building, while it could be very beautiful and a nice public access, we'd like to be ensured that it is 100% public. It is never going to be privatized. It can't be rented and used by the private club to host a pickleball party or yeah. whatever. Thank you. Diana, wait, stop and start. First of all, hello, but I can't hear you. So talk louder. It's nice to see your face. Talk louder. The owl. Okay, just tell you, Lauren, can you please put up this slide? Um, I think it's page 21. So we're looking at what you're talking about. Sure, sure. sure. Yeah, I was just saying, Justine, sorry, Jeff, um, that I think there are two things. I know for, for years there have been ongoing discussions with the current tenant about the use in the building. Um, specifically leading up to the eventual redevelopment. Um, point well taken first. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the needs, one, acknowledging um, the building, I think, is a public treasure, is, is very top of mind. Um, obviously, there are a lot of constraints surrounding um, the resiliency infrastructure for the building, um, specifically in our in our maritime workshop, we really tried to hone in on the decision making surrounding the design for the battery maritime building. But um, you know the the open space, and I think this is a great example of how we are trying to uh, incorporate existing community needs and desires um, while we're in there doing um, this resiliency work is is starting to come through. And I'll acknowledge it's. It's work in progress, right? Um, we're not we're not all of the way there. Um, I think there's a lot of progress that we're making in that regard as it relates to using the opportunity to um, solve some of the longstanding issues in front of the building and incorporating as much public use and access as we can around and, and in the back of the building. Um, and I'll leave it there. Maybe if we can talk a little more specifically uh, about the design and those considerations in that in that open space. Do we have any of those specific yeah. renderings? Yeah. <laughs> More in previous slide, please. Page 20. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I, I have a follow up question to that. 
that space as well because um, I think this is the first. Correct me if I'm wrong. First building, uh, and I like how you said the three options in terms of you know what to do with it. But I think this is the first building we've heard that is actually over the um, you know it's a what do you call it? a cantilever, mm -hmm. right? It's a cantilever over the water. And you're going to um, make it a resilient from under and around. I think this is the first building, by correct, of any building in any part of the water. Um, like Pier A doesn't get this consideration. Uh, you know, we even heard like I've rewatched all the videos that we just had. That's what I've been doing. And uh, Gateway has like a little sliver over the path over the over the. Uh, Cantilever, but I don't think there's any, and, and of course, the winter garden is a cantilever over that. That's that is some sort of cantilever, but um, that's a big decision to decide. And how you know, just in terms of like, I don't know what that means when the water comes up, what that pressure is. I mean, is that you know, like the we, we heard from Catherine they use about the slurry wall? You know, are you essentially building a slurry wall? Around this building, under and on the side of it, to take the massive pressure that's going to be coming. Because, I mean, am I missing something? But like, I think that's a big deal, right? That you decided to do this, and then if you decided to do that and not let it flood or move it or elevate it, whatever that is, then like, what is that asset? I think to Tammy's point, everybody else's point, because it hasn't been an asset that's ever really turned out for us. That we yeah. don't like. That's exactly right. That PRA, there's somebody, a pure 17, I mean, so many things. So many things that could be. We can't hear Wendy. So I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask um, to speak to your engineering question. I'm gonna ask Ronnie because this is like highly engineered land bill. With flood defense, I'm going to ask her to speak to um, uh, that. Um, I will reiterate that there's like no, we during the master plan phase very clearly determined that there's no new development that will happen as a part of this, that, that everything will be limited to one to two story buildings um, uh, within kind of any area, new public space that we're creating. Um, and there is not, a you're not missing anything. There is not a plan, uh, to increase the, the zoning or otherwise density at this site. Everything that, um, uh, is kind of shown in these designs is really about trying to both maximize public space as part of one of the overall goals of the master plan and provide the best possible alignment for um, the coastal defense infrastructure. Um, I think probably we should we should maybe do a, a meeting where we take you through all of the considerations because it went as far as looking at um, elevating the entire structure, um, actually moving the entire yeah, structure. I like that you put that in. in and I think, um, uh, you know, it may benefit. We, we only did one slide on it, but perhaps we should really walk you through what all those it's, considerations were. I think it's were. a great idea, Alexis. I actually wanted to ask, uh, Lauren, can you bring up slide, I guess it's 21 or uh, 25. I'm not sure that, actually keep going, um, go to 20, the bigger picture that this, yeah, this one, that's good enough. What are we 24? Um, it, can you go to 25? I'm just not sure which one it was where it shows the whole. All right, whatever. That's close enough. You know, I know we spoke about this, Matthew, you know, the 1st of all, Bravo on starting to really hone down on the idea of that Coast Guard site, you know, and what and the, the flexibility, but this. This plan kills me because your supposable number, you've divided the site into three parts. So you've got the seaport here, you've got the, what you call the resilient ferry hub, and then you have the multi-level waterfront park. 
Well, in reality, the multi-level waterfront park is, in a sense, the more of Brazilian ferry terminal. This is really the ferry terminal. It's not just a park. And as we talked about, to try to begin to bring those facilities together would be incredibly helpful and important in really being able to release that center portion of the site somewhat to more parkland, which is very narrow, which doesn't answer the community's interest in recreation, right, and such, still not going to do it. You know, when you talk about uh, Little Island, you know, beautiful site that it is, it ain't about recreation, let's face mm -hmm. it. It's about circulation. And this will also probably, if you, I don't want to say suffer, but will also be a site of circulation. So. You know, the idea, like when I saw this and you spoke about consideration of moving the ferry building, taking away the whole idea that you're totally 100% that it's not really a public building anymore. If that went to the Coast Guard site, for example, on ground, because you don't need it to be in the water anymore, then I think to myself, wow, you've opened up that whole thing from put, just push all the ferry to the south. I don't know if that's been something that was ever considered, but it does open up, the, you know, getting that control of that Coast Guard site might really open up some possibilities here to release these, it's really all a ferry terminal. You know, there's a lot of ferry going on here. And I just, I can see the struggle. You could sense the sort of tightness of it. And I don't know, I just really advocate for that. I'm delighted to yeah. hear about it. So anyway, that's yeah, yeah, more on yeah. the same. I know, I'm very glad to hear how you kind of characterize the opportunity there, because um, we agree. Right. Um, we had not contemplated moving the BMB there, but I now that, think now we have an idea. Um, give, them, give them, you know, beautiful space above and a parking deck built in and all the things that they need, because they want that, you know, so, I mean, give them everything and more that they want, because they won't give it up unless they get something better. Yeah, I mean, and I think we need to consider, yeah, what their uses are, what their uses in the future will be. And is there an opportunity to build both of those so that you could build, you know, something that has integrated flood defense um, and um, able to move some of the operations. So you're decongesting some of this area. Yeah, I think it's I think and, there's, and there's, there's a natural match with the Coast Guard building and being able to, to get to Governor's Island as well, mm -hmm. because there is National Park Service space on Governor's Island. So there's a natural kind of kismet benefit that we could potentially help. And we've spoken with our congressman on it, who was very supportive of the idea as well. So I think um, we have some elected support behind the dialogue and now could be the time that we can make progress as we improve things for them improve things for us and very specifically as we've spoken about before we want more than circulation on this project we actually want public space and usage of space more than the rooftops we want open recreation we really want more <laughs> sorry um, so, yeah, so, you have yeah I grab it. you grab it and then i've got three others so Yes, to the offer to come back on this particular mm -hmm. thing. And I'd love to see yeah. if you can consider, you know, putting this on terra firma, could essentially that's what you want to do with this building and things. Anyway, all right. Next question from Rosa Chang, patiently waiting. Rosa, thank you. Hi. You still yep, I am here. I'm just starting my video. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, so, uh, first of all, hi, everybody. I missed you guys. <laughs> Um, so I just want to thank you because, uh, number one, well, I, I mean, I have a lot of points, I'm sorry, but I'm going to start off by thanking you because we all know what the U S army Corps of engineers plan looks like. And, um, it really highlights that we really appreciate the deep work and consideration that you have all put in to these projects to provide, you know, real community benefit. To help mitigate the ineg inevitable negative, that is um, what you have when you have to build up this enormous wall right at our water, and so um, being slapped in the face with the alternative, <laughs> um, which they presented us. I just want to say, and I think, frankly, a lot of us in the community want to say, we might not agree with everything that you have done, and we may keep pushing. At, well, no, we will keep pushing for more <laughs> and better. I mean, you know us. <laughs> Um, and we will always keep pushing. Um, but I think that our goal is to create something uh, that is a real 
benefit to the community beyond our generation, because that's what this has to be. And so we thank you for really working with us to make that happen. And we do appreciate it. And we especially appreciate the constant engagement that you all go through um, to make sure that it is a real dialogue. And, and we can see that you take our comments in and that you adapt. And we, we really appreciate that. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, then. Um, on the FDR, I'm just going to chime in since you asked us to chime in. So my vote is take it down. Take it down. <laughs> um, I think that there is this awesome thing called the Reconnecting Communities Federal Grant Program, which I think would uh, be, this seems like it would actually reconnect our communities. And so I would wonder if that might be something that might put a little bit more money into that specific effort. Um, but I know that's likely a state you know, things since that's what you guys just said. Um, the area behind the major boat docking uh, area at Old Slip, it looks like the uh, the walkways, the pedestrian routes, the park space behind it um, on the land side are really blocked. It almost seems like a little bit like alley-like, frankly. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any way to reconsider that in terms of elevational changes, in terms of whatever, so that it doesn't feel like you basically are blocked from the water and looking just into the docks or the piers, but that you actually have an experience that may elevate up beyond that and open up the view um, instead of just seeing the boats, right? So that, that would be one that would be comment. Um, sorry? Try 21, sorry. Uh, pull up the slide to show what you're talking about. It says refined waterfront. Circulation. Yes. Um, Lauren, that's refined waterfront circulation. It might be page 21, 2, or 3. Oh, cool. You're bringing up the slide. Yeah, there it was. Go back. Sorry, you had it the first time. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, you see how it says lower level waterfront, and then I know that it connects, but the upper level, I feel like you're really um, creating, uh, basically all you're gonna see is the boats. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm wondering if there's any way to have that experience be different so that you can see past the boats, um, rather than feeling that, that that's all you see, because that seems like it would be a very unpleasant um, experience. Um, the other thing is, uh, I know this may sound funny, but it really is not. I fear for your life. You are not responding and respecting Gail's beach. And I think that will only lead to, um, death and destruction. So I'm just putting that out there. You need to respect Gail's beach because if you don't, bad things will happen. <laughs> um, and, and sorry. And Rosa. Amen. What? Amen. Thank I don't you. need any bad karma. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and it is a very um, special and unique spot. And I know that um, as the water level rise uh, rises inevitably, I, I don't know quite how what the effect of that will actually be. But um, hopefully it would just become a higher beach and building a concrete wall in front of it seems like a completely the wrong move. And yet that's what I am seeing in all of your drawings. And then of course, selfishly from Gotham Park's perspective, um, that is not what we want to see at all. We want to see an open vista that sort of connects to the view of Brooklyn um, and the sort of soaring of the Brooklyn Bridge above your head. And so I would ask you to look at that again. Um, and then in that same area, um, I would also say the connection to BNPR is something that um, is very delicate, as Alice pointed out. And I'm, I'm still honestly sort of traumatized by the 10 foot concrete wall that's going to be the tie in from BMCR that separates Smith houses from the rest of the what we hope will be Gotham Park. So, um, I think maybe the only way to sort of mitigate that might be if that turns into our downtown um, east side public pool 
So just tossing that out there. And the whole cost of the, the scope of these projects, that's nothing, but it would be a real community benefit that we don't have. Um, so, so I would just urge you to consider that as an option strongly. <laughs> um, the other thing is the community center. I just want to say that again, because uh, the idea that we could actually have a really awesome community center right there um, is wonderful. And I really love that you've integrated that into the design um, for the project. Then, let's see. Um, oh, parking. Um, as was mentioned earlier, if, if there's any point where you're going above a certain height that you don't need to have filled with clean fill, but you could actually integrate parking on site instead, we would love to be able to get rid or not get rid of. Um, we would love, I mean, we would like that too, but we would love to relocate some of our on street public vehicles, AKA NYC, sanitation, DOT, parks department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, into spaces that we do not have to see them. And if you have to build up anyways, it sort of seems like it's screaming to be used. <laughs> Um, in a more efficient multi use way. So just going to keep hitting that drum <laughs> until it happens. Um, so you might as well just do it just so I shut up. Then, uh, the other thing, let me think, what was the last thing that I wanted to mention? Oh, funding federal funding specifically. Just throwing this out there and this may be a totally crazy idea, but the, um, all of the areas north of the bridge are actually. Bridge are actually disadvantaged communities on a federal level. And what that does is that all of the federal funding for projects related to those areas actually cover 100% of cost. So just occurred to me that if we happen to tie together Gotham Park with FIDI Seaport Resiliency, um, mm -hmm. then that would cover the northern side. And just if we were to creatively look at that, could we have 100% cost coverage of FIDI Seaport Resiliency plus Gotham Park? And that was a question. You're advocating, Rosa, but you're not hearing anything in the room yet. What? You're not getting answers yet. You need advocacy. Why not? I wrote down uh, your comments, and I think that we can actually be responsive to Um, standpoint, um, what you're talking about is kind of that old slip and that, that experience is something that I think we want to actually refine understanding the design there. Um, so I, I think we can, can probably come back to you on many of these. Um, the scoping of federal study. Oh, I'm sorry. It's so hard to hear you. You're going in and out. She said that the director said that the, that the financial aspect was outside of her expertise, but that she would get back to us on all the other, on all the other points. Okay. Great. Thank you, Rosa. Thanks so much. It's Thank done. you. Thank you, Rosa. All right. I've got the last hand up, um, Michael Kramer. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rosa hit upon a couple of things I was going to talk about. I want to remind everybody that the Seaport Working Group talked about studying taking down the FDR back in 2014, 2015. 2015. So it's something so that's it's something you know, been that on the table for a while. And, um, and I think the community board came, you know, may have passed a resolution way back when as well. Uh, my question is about this design team that's about to come on board. Could you tell us more about the scope of services? What, what do we, you expect them to do and how is that? How can it be public, public facing? Which one, Michael? Oh, I'm talking about the, the one for the seaport. I can, I can answer that. Hi, Michael. This is Kathleen Chan. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, how are you? Um, within the RFP, it was very clear that the community engagement and working with the community was a very important part of it. 
part of the RFP. In terms of the respondents, they have addressed it and they've been very robust in their responses for community engagement. So, um, when the time comes and we have awarded the team, you will start to see a very robust community engagement with uh, the design team and with the community. Okay, thank you. And and I just wanted to reiterate that uh, we're all very grateful that the uh, Seaport Piers Recreation Center has been a subject of today's tonight's conversation and and onward. And we look forward to continue to work on that. Mm -hmm. We are we're very excited about getting them on board. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. We can't hear anything. Can somebody Sorry. speak, please? Yep, I'll be slower. Um, so we would like individual presentations. Um, one overall theme that I see in everything that I find very disturbing is something that um, we are building walls against the water. So there is very little public access unless you're hopping onto a commercial boat. And I think that's a mistake when you live on an island. And we've worked very hard, um, DEC and the testimony with DEP about potentially having the waters be accessible at some level. I understand a closed cove is not safe for getting a boat in, but I don't think anyone necessarily said, let's keep them closed. You know, what if, is there no opportunity, especially when you think of the Brooklyn Bridge of doing some kind of jetty or uh, not fully enclosed cove, so you can have water that is less virulent to allow some kind of touchdown or access. And then everything that I've seen is a disconnect from the water. It is all a view to the water, but does nothing to ensure that people actually can get to or utilize. Um, there's no public programming at all there's no, for argument's sake, uh, when I take a look at the west side, I'm incredibly jealous of the work that goes on at the Hudson River Park Trust, where they look to do access to the water out almost everywhere. So whether it's a touchdown, it's a marsh, it's um, the volleyball courts out on the pier, whether it's uh, the new Gansevoort where you can pull up in a kayak, things like that, which really reinforce the fact that we are an island. It would be extremely sad for community board one if the Hudson River Park Trust is the only group in community board one that looks at that. And I say that to both the Battery Park City Authority, who handles the lower west side of our waterfront, all the way around the Battery Conservancy, and then up the east side. And that is a consistent thing that I will say at every single meeting. And as long as we're looking at the Battery Maritime, I know the private club is also looking at the Battery Maritime building for what they want to see behind their building. But my supposition is as important and beautiful as that building is, is as important and beautiful for public access to it, to maintain for somehow, some way, and public usage. The, the Coast Guard site is critical. And anything that we can do to help EDC and help the city and help, we will make that ask. And we will be with, there with you at every point because it is prime real estate. We're not making much more shoreline. And it is critical that we not leave opportunities like that off. There's even tiny little beach space in between, you know, the all the little buildings there. So really taking a look to carefully say, is that a, is that a visit? versus a place for garbage to collect. Is that a place that you could turn it into um, 
an enclosed area for a plus pool? Is it an enclosed area where a kid could, you know, do a little motorized boat like they have in Central Park? I mean, there's so many different opportunities that we really need to look at to make sure that we are not commercializing <laughs> and polluting because we are not at the point of green energy. I'd like to say that we are, but we're not there yet. And even by the time this project is done from the edge of Battery Park City all the way up through East Side Coastal Resiliency, we will not be at a point that we're fully hybrid and we're not worrying about fumes and diesel anymore. So we need to really think about that when we're looking at what the public uses are. Because the public does not want to sit below the heliport next to diesel fumes. And in the last dialogue that we had and people brought out, there's lots of ribbons of green, but they're all designed to be walkways and pathways to the ferry systems. It's not necessarily a place that you're, you're, you're sending your kids to throw a ball to learn how to ride a bike or to go sailing. And I look at that as, as a public use overall feedback. Um, uh, and then wrap it up. That's um, I'm it here. And then what I would love to hear in the infrastructure is Governor's Island has a commitment to be the first green ferry. So let's hear more about what the city is doing to plug that in, and how we're going to expand that to every other location. So once the Governor's Island Ferry is determined and they know what they're buying, how does that affect Pier 11? How does that affect, what is the rollout to truly get a point that we don't just have, quote unquote, the Governor's Island team looking at it? What is the requirement that the city puts on all the new ferries from there, that point forward for the new locations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I hope to hear all of that at the individual presentation so we can do resolutions. Okay. I'm going to give Tammy, uh, sorry, Wendy, one minute. Yeah, I think, I think that Tammy had the same thing. One of the things I wanted to ask for is that I've gone and testified to um, the city is looking to uh, make the water more swimmable and touchable and all of that good stuff. And I saw the walkway shown two examples, one with a railing along the side and one without a railing along the side. And I was really curious about could we possibly have the no railing along the side? And um, what would that mean? And I know that would be a big step and a, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't know what that means, but I think the community wants to, to Tammy's point, touch the water more. And then I'd love to have you come back because I'm also obsessed with combined sewer overflows mm -hmm. and um, pump stations. And like, I am so into that. Yeah, and, um, that. I'm so into that. And we didn't have time. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't have time for that today. We have a so, whole drainage. So, yeah, yeah, it's gonna like, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> so, no. um, but I just want to say this was just really great. And my, I will say my, um, I want more people to hear this, including the next generation. Yeah. And I keep saying this at every meeting. Is there any way we can put this on something cool that young people watch so that they're getting snippets? I, I just watched a lot of YouTube today of old meetings. And one of the meetings that was, that was well, well done was the um, walk, walk around meeting that, um, I, I don't know how I had missed that, the, the, the walking with the pole and how high everything was. That, was um, that, but shorter, because my kids won't watch the whole thing. So um, I just feel like the next generation, they're watching their phones all the time, and mm -hmm. we've got to get the message out that things are happening, because they do not know what's happening. And I will just say that we're not doing enough still. Yeah. And I don't know what the right answer is because I'm completely uncool. But there is something they that have you, a vested interest. Yeah, you have so. lots of interns okay. on this front that um yeah. that to, to to help all of you do this and get the message out. But then anyway, thank you. Thanks. That's good. They're all really terrific ways to I hope this was helpful to the to all of you folks. And I can't thank you enough for the extraordinary amount of time and interest and thoughtfulness and presentation and receptiveness to what's being said and hopefully at this next iteration in September at the public meeting we'll be able to see a little bit of this and so we are going to say yes to the meeting on battery maybe you want to bring that together with the pump and sewage stuff that's going to excite Wendy um, <laughs> and then um, but and but then 
I don't know exactly when this could happen. So do you really want yeah. to work with us on the timing so we don't let too much time go by? But okay. specifically in September, I'd really like to have the battery presentation um, with full scale draw, you know, full scale scale drawings and perspectives and things that we can understand. Because I could not figure out what's really going on, particularly vis-a-vis the um the, the restaurant building and the wharf and the tented areas i mean these are this is a critical area for all of us um and it was a little understandably fast and so okay. just to come back and flush it out that would be wonderful well, I, had, I had a question no, no no i had a question actually um yeah in terms of that battery meeting whenever it's scheduled do you want to have our yeah. CM there. I just want yeah. to make sure and have Eve there to talk through like what the construction looks like. That yeah. was my Specifically, we really want to hear about Pier A. So whoever is dealing with that, this is at these junctures where we don't hear about the area where the two, you know, BMCC and 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 the South the, Battery Park. South, South, no, but the, no, I'm talking about on the on the east side come together. All those junks, those joints, are to be really well explored. Yeah, so I just want to say it's. Like, where is puree and all this? Well, right, that's the same package of work. It's puree and the battery and the same package of work. So, I just wanted to make sure that we can just let um, our CM know. We can let the person know. Another long night for you, Claudia. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. No, I just want to make sure that you obviously have answers to questions related to coordination and how the work is going to be. Because we obviously, as I said, we've been working a lot with the EDC team and with parks on it. So, we want to make sure that people are there to answer that. That would be great. Access and definitely. egress at all points. Right. And then not to let you guys off the list but if we're going to do that part in september um you have a larger meeting about the master plan in september i we would still like to see in october then the follow-up on connections with escr bmcr and the historic seaport like to break those out to have that kind of a chunk so we can go through because at the same time we're going to be working with battery park city authority on the northwest and it's a lot it's the entire coastline for the most part, I mean, ex of community board one, and you have to give people time to digest the information. That's the biggest problem that. Okay, so let's give we don't that know, if we don't, if Alice and I still have questions and we've seen all these meetings, imagine what the person who just walked into the room is thinking. All right, 830, we're moving on. Thank you. We're going to move on to the northwest northwest Battery Park City. I don't. I assume that you get we get to go home now, right? The rest. He should listen. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Terrific. Tremendous presentation. Great. And really helpful. Okay. So. We do have my marker for the um, I'm in August, and you won't be here. Be very quiet yeah, and start the parting because the owls <laughs> will catch the <laughs> not too much criticizing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, okay. Claudia, Nick, and Gwen, I'm sorry it is late, but you probably suspect that it would go on a bit. Um, so uh one of you, Nick, sure. took over, you had this is on the Northwest Battery Park City in Truman Sea. You had wanted to have follow-up on engagement. And on the reaches, um, and I'll let Nick take over as to what their your yep. your process is going to be now. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm going to speak up a little bit so the owl can catch me, <laughs> and for the folks online, uh, the owl's been looking at me for two and a half hours, and it is cute. I have to admit, it's a little creepy, but mostly cute. <laughs> and I, for one, welcome our new technological overlords. So. Um, what we did, and I spoke with Alice and uh, and Tammy about this, but uh, speaking of kind of a lot of information to take in um, for projects that are in various stages of development, but but, but moving forward, um, we had had, and Claudia had noted, a very successful Northwest Battery Park City Resiliency Project public meeting on June 26th. We had over 230 people attend um, two sessions. They were Twin sessions, both online and in person. We had a lengthy presentation, which is now, as Claudia also noted, online and available for folks to access and enter their comments in because we want to keep the conversation going. I had spoken with Gwen and uh, with uh, with Alice and Tammy, Wendy, Jeff, Justine, and others, uh, and we knew that there was obviously still uh, some questions and some, I think the want for some additional time to continue to digest what people had seen and continue to get feedback on what they had seen prior to moving to the next stage of design. So with that, I will turn it over to Gwen Dawson, who's our senior vice president for real property at BPCA. 
there's uh, kind of taken that feedback and wanted to to discuss a little bit of a shift in the timeline to provide for additional time for public feedback on the 30% design. So with that, I don't want to steal your thunder. Gwen, if you're still with us, you can walk through uh, for the benefit of the folks here and online, the new thinking with respect to timeline uh, and feedback for public engagement. Is she here? She should be here. Okay. I don't see her online. She's the 347 number. Oh, okay, yes. Go ahead. Yep. Is she she's unmuted. Gwen, you should be unmuted. Is she there? Hello? Is she yep. Hey Gwen. Hello? Yep, I think you're there. Hi there. Hey. Hi everyone. Hi, Sorry everyone. I can't Sorry be there. there. This evening I've got a terrible yeah, echo terrible on my echo. phone. Um so I'll make this very brief because this will drive me crazy. Uh, as Nick said, and as, as Claudia alluded to, when we uh, did our 30% um, design meeting back in uh, late June, the plan had been to uh, look for uh, comments to be received from the community to those 30% uh, plans by the end of July um, at, to be taken into account as the design team advanced toward a 60% design in the fall. Um, however, we, we did, um, there were a couple of things that were factored into that. One was uh, that we, there were a couple of locations within uh, reach uh, one and reach five uh, where for various reasons, um, the design team uh, was not able to actually achieve a 30% design um, milestone with those locations. Um, and the expectation had been that, that the, those 30% design advancements would uh, be forthcoming fairly quickly. Uh, there was al there's also the expectation that um, all of the um, uh, answers to the comments and questions that were received at the 30% design meeting would uh, be answered in short order in writing so that they would be, those answers would be available for, uh, for folks to take a look at and to help inform their comments back to us. Uh, what uh, we found since that meeting is number one, the two locations that had not been advanced to 30% are taking a little longer to get to that 30% um, design milestone. In addition, um, because we had a very fulsome um, attendance at that meeting and follow up to the meeting from community members with comments and questions, um, the, uh, it took longer than anticipated to get the answers to those questions in written form so that they could be um, looked at by by interested parties, um, so it didn't. It wound up kind of not making sense to um, look towards um, getting those comments back by the end of July, since we're almost at the end of July now. Um, as a result, we uh, we've asked the design team to um, formulate a, a, an alternate. Um, uh, schedule that would take into account some additional time um, for the community to absorb uh, new information, um, comments that were received, as well as the information that, that was available at the time of the meeting. Um, we don't have the um, exact timeline for that yet, but uh, suffice it to say that we are, are looking at um, not um, not requiring or are targeting uh, comments for the 30% design until probably sometime in September. Um, we, um, we are looking to um, have another meeting um, with the community, kind of a, a 30 plus des uh, percent design meeting that would um, include those other two locations and also some additional details on reach two as well that we that were not that was not available at the time of the meeting and we anticipate that we will get 
all of the, the questions answered and the comments answered in writing um, and available to the, everyone by next week. So um, we will, in, in the next week to 10 days, we will have an alternate schedule available, uh, but we're looking to um, push things out um, and certainly don't, uh, no one needs to worry about needing to get comments back to us before uh, September, unless they want to, we're, we're taking them uh, as we go along. Um, and then we're also looking at, um, at the same, in the same period of time, um, in that um, September-ish timeframe, doing these, the uh, site walkthroughs that, um, that have been requested and that folks found to be um, so helpful. So we expect to have both of those, um, those um, things available um, in the September timeframe um, and uh, with, with some additional opportunity for folks to submit um, comments. And we think that's fair and will give a, an opportunity for much better um, uh, feedback um, on, on these designs. Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks, Gwen. Um, we have questions. We're yeah. We're going to take questions. Um, I mean, so we have until September to, um, I guess it's still unclear. Although there has been great interest in having, you know, Two or three reaches at each meeting, you know, all uh, of all seven. Now we're just going to have two and a half, I guess, a little bit of two come back to the community board. Is that what's happening? So just no, no, no. We're, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we're not. Please um, make sure that you understand that, that we will have we will a, have we will a, have a proposed. Um, timeline, we don't have it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm saying September ish. Um, but we don't have um, a, 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 a timeline that has been vetted through the design team, through the authority, and, and we, don't, we haven't matched up dates with, with other things that are going on. So um, there, may, there may very well be something about one or more of the reaches that we want to um, focus on. I don't know. We'll, but we'll have, a, we'll have a proposal for how to deal with that. And um, the, the, I know the request that you had for some reach specific meetings, there may be certain topics about one or more of the reaches that, that lend themselves to uh, standalone meetings. We'll, 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 we'll talk about that. Yeah, let me just be clear that, and I think I speak uh, you know, we, we have received quite a number of interested parties about follow through on other reaches, you know, and we get some emails and this and that. And so that's where this idea came up. And I know Justine and her committee discussed it too, that there would be another opportunity and to have a sort of reach by reach review of how all of the different ideas that have been presented to you of these public meetings were being um, employed at 30 percent or 35 or 40 percent. So that's what the hope is. I assume that will come to us in this next iteration, if I'm hearing you right. And to be clear, I, I kind of sort of reviewed how, many, how often we saw each other over the last many years. And in what I would call reach eight, which was, of course, the edge of Wagner Park, that's your last reach, mm -hmm. um, right? Um, we had over, I think I counted 20 meetings um, at the community board level on just that three and a half acre parcel of land. But now we've only had one meeting for each one of these reaches, one public meeting per reach. Not, I'm not talking about the GEO, you know, the, those wonderful meetings where you kind of introduce the whole concept, but anyway, reach by reach, right? If I'm not mistaken, one or two on the certain ones and two. And that, I think it's a problem is I think that at least for me personally, I can say, having been really close to this for so many years, it does seem like an, we want to make sure we've offered the public an opportunity to really, again, drill down and opine on each reach and the, the people that live there, the people that 
that frequent there really have an opportunity to speak. And I would think that would be helpful again to the authority, hopefully, as it was sometimes in the past, and to avoid some of the pitfalls we had. Now, I realize when you went from design, bid, build to design, yeah. Bid, design bid, yeah, right there, that was a huge change. Um, and that's really where this all began. I guess that was in around 2020, April 2020 or so. And I understand that that has cut out a lot of the back and forth potential for back and forth, but we need a little bit more at a minimum. And so I think that's what we were hoping to advocate for in this next phase, which is reach by reach, community engagement, everybody on board with each one, at least one more meeting per reach. Right. Yeah, Gwen, so you I, want to take that? I stated that correctly. Is yep. that fair to? I don't know if everyone. No, it's important to me. But yeah, well, I refer, you know, it well, seems actually, like, let me say something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. No, I, this definitely, is we need to take notice. There's a lot of people have thought into this book yeah. with us. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Jeff. There's no such thing as too much public engagement. So I think it, it is definitely valuable to get input from as many people. On as many aspects of a project like this um, as possible. In my mind, I'm not as constrained in my thinking of the project in terms of reach by reach by reach by reach. And, and, and actually, I would not look forward to having six meetings to cover six reaches. Um, my, we've seen a lot of this design now in quite a bit of detail. And, I, and, and for me, I can identify certain aspects of it that are not necessarily reach specific that merit a lot of thought, uh, a lot of additional uh, thought and, um, you know, such as the intersection of the streets to the waterfront. Uh, right now you've got open vistas. When you put in the flood protections, you're going to necessarily constrain, no matter what you do, you're going to constrain those vistas. And I think a lot of attention needs to be given to that. Another area that's common to a lot of the reaches is the fact that a design decision with which the community has supported or indeed advocated to essentially let Rockefeller Park flood in the 100 year storm. We haven't really discussed what that means when if Rockefeller Park is going to be under 10 feet of water. Does that mean that after the flood, everything's going to have to be rebuilt? All the trees are going to have to be replanted, or have we determined that those trees, in fact, will be resilient to uh, 10 feet of water for eight hours or however long the, it takes before the, uh, the the flood retracts? Those are, I mean, I'm just giving these as examples of issues, but it's not really. And yeah, that's basically reach two or three or, but but it's it's really sort of global. It's issue. like more more like issue like sort of issue driven rather than right. necessarily reach driven. Right. And and I wouldn't mind having a meeting devoted to you know us identifying the issues that we think are important. And if it turns out that yeah, there's actually five of them for reach. Maybe we need to have uh, you know reach specific meeting. But I think it would be helpful if we could identify the issues that that we as a committee think need really thought put to them and then decide what that translates to in terms of what kind of meetings. That, that's just my own personal way. If, if I could, yeah, if I could, yeah, if I could respond, if I could respond to that, um, that, that is, that is a, uh, precisely how my thinking has, um, ha, has advanced that, um, as opposed to the the reach specific meetings, which served a purpose um, at the at the time that that we did them, um, that there may be there may be particular issues, there may be particular design decisions um, or um, implications that um, that may not be reach specific, or they may be um, that that may warrant their own um, their own standalone discussions and and certainly um, I think we're we're open to that well I think that's the ultimate point here and I don't mean to yeah. you know but I guess what you're saying I appreciate what you're saying you know maybe the specifics of reach reach although you point out exactly that that Rockefeller Park is one condition but, but maybe it's a huge issue and one reach and a huge issue in another reach and you can actually come but right. I, I think, my, I, I think meeting, the but. point I wanted to make originally, and the point that I'm going to answer to that, uh, is that 
what we need is a bit more time to have the discussion, whether it's reach by reach or condition by condition or, you know, trees. Well, it sounds that. like we're getting it. Right. So that is to me what we really need. And I will need to point out that 20 meetings versus one, 20 meetings for three and a half acres plot of land versus one meeting for many acres is a little uneven. And I appreciate that this went from design bid built to design bid, yeah. but that has to be a little bit evened out so that people really have the opportunity to gauge in whatever way you will ultimately think it useful. And I agree. I think it's a great exercise to take the community's comments that we've received as well as this committee to try to synthesize, if you will, what conditions are universal to certain, you know, parcels of the area, uh, you know, that, that seems to make a lot of sense and might be helpful to the authority. So anyway, I think it all comes to the same point, which is great that you're doing more great that you're giving us a little more, uh, more time to discuss it and to present. And we should probably do some homework pretty quickly. Yes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it to everybody on the committee to please go ahead and let's talk about this probably by email because we're closing shop here in August. And with your neighbors. And yes, of course. Yeah. Robert, I, I have like a lot of neighbors, like I got a flood of emails, believe me. So I will be happy to synthesize those. I'm sure That'd you helpful. have too. And but, I think it's but Claudia and yeah. Nick and Gwen. Part of moving to September, knowing that we're off in August, is as an agency for us to do business, we need to be able to do resolutions. We have to be able to do a resolution to send to you, because that's the, the voice of the board. It's beyond the engagement at a meeting. And my, my appreciation for the delay is intense, because it's what's needed. But we need to do the business of the board's opining, which means, however, we lay it out in September in order for us to be able to do a resolution is really important. And if that takes longer than a month, depending on how the discussions work for breakout, and we need to have it September and October, we're not talking years. We're talking allowing the business of the board to proceed. So our votes are on record that is really important to how we operate as partners sure no yeah understood and i think i mean as gwen said i think we're still waiting on a preliminary schedule just to see like a first pass at what this looks like obviously we know that that's the boards is you know that's the way that you register like concerns the way we can address them in a formal fashion so i think again we do need to see what this Preliminary review and to make sure that that time allows, because as we, we were saying before, when, Friday, when the fire support team was presenting, like September is a busy month. Yep. They're having an open house. There's the holidays. School is back. Like, again, I think we all know the horrors of scheduling, like in some months compared to others, especially when you're right back from the summer, the break, the recess part. September and the fall generally are. Busy. Yeah, it's very challenging. So, I mean, I think that we're, I think that we're willing to work and, and find a way to make sure that you have enough time. That we're allowing enough time for the feedback and that we're not just trying to rush it to again get to a conclusion. You know, within I think within within a reasonable time frame, but I think that we're willing to be flexible. We have not seen sort of what this will look like yet. So I think that we just have to wait and sort of see. What do, what do you mean what this will look like? What the, what the revised schedule, like Gwen was talking about earlier in terms of like the revised, like we're expecting a revised sort of what this would look like in terms of like what the fall would look like in terms of engagement. In terms of coming back to community. Yeah, like in terms of engagement conversation, I mean, whatever exactly. way this gets. When the walks we'll, walks. We'll, continue, we'll continue this discussion with, with you um, within the next week to 10 days when we have um, a, a better set of, of target dates that we think that we are think going, to work going to work in terms of sharing the, the, sharing the, the, the information the that you need. When, when will we get we'll the get, answer we'll get. to the questions? I'm sure you said it, Gwen, but I don't remember. She said it. She yeah, said it. Next, next week. Yep, no. Next week. Next week. Yeah. All the answers to all the questions that are out there. The me. questions, right? The questions that were posed at the meeting that we didn't get to, in okay. terms of also questions that we may have gotten to at the meeting, and then also comment cards, notes that people put on the boards outside and on the map. So we have all those that we're going to be responding to. All right. And then I have like a whole series of questions I got in the last two days, some of which you had put down here. Are those part of the 
part of the package. Um, I, if you want to send uh, Alex, if you want to send them to me, so, like okay. we're happy to include them as part of the. I mean, I yeah. emailed. Yeah, no, yeah. Yes, I've got for, You wrote. You want. You want to read your. You did a very nice job here. I don't know. It seemed like there was a lot of things on your list. Well, there. Uh, right, well, in yeah. terms of the comments that you sent over to me in the email, those we will okay. be. Well, we have and will respond to as part of this larger sort of. Digest, for lack of a better way to put it, of questions that but I have. I mean, my concerns, though, when we're taking a look at this, obviously, is where the community engagement is, right? We heard nothing on financials, which we know the Battery Park City Authority committee meeting in September is supposed to have a presentation by the CFO on, on general financials. So, my question is, is that going to include then a separate sub? Thing on resiliency financials is that where you're bringing that in? Like, we need to kind of understand where all the information is coming to to be able to work with you as a partner. In other words, we would love to see the walkthroughs with the public before the presentations again. So, with the questions answered and the walkthroughs, then it's a very robust dialogue because you have the opportunity to go on the walkthroughs, right? And people are seeing and talking. Um, we know uh, at the presentation. Wait, can we him. get that? Could we get that arrangement? That timing? Yeah, that's what we were. That's that's, yeah, that's, okay. yeah, that's what we were talking about. To have it before, so that way people are have actually been out and looked at it. So questions that can be raised during those walks, or obviously going into those workshop meetings, or we're right. calling them whatever we're going to call them. Right? They can come in and ask those questions, or right. build on questions they've already asked. That walkthrough. So you mentioned that you have agency review in yes. August. It's so, ongoing. Yeah, it's ongoing right okay. now. So my question on agency review is, what are the e individual timelines with the agencies? And that's an important thing to understand. When Gwen's referring to two reaches, I'm referring to one, two, and five because those are the three that have more agency involvement than any of the others, which are more. For the most part, primarily BPCA. Right, there's so, minimal touch points. Right. With so, what I don't think the public understands, for example, is something that I heard necessarily that you would not be able to get, for example, feedback from DEP until you are at X design percentage to present plans, that they kind of are nodding along the way, or state DOT, for example. Um, I think one of the it, it's important to, for the public to understand where those agencies and when will opine because we're not seeing that and we want to see that. That's part of the problem that we're looking for for a task force and goes back to the basic roots of issues that we all know. Once you dig up the ground, mm. you find it. and things are very different. I learned this at every DDC presentation that the community board gets, and you would think after all the times that they've ripped up the roads that there's a roadmap of what's under there, but that doesn't happen. You'd be surprised. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh, I'm not surprised anymore. I sat in the first few times. <laughs> but, I mean, those are conversations because I know you did the traffic studies. Okay. So, the traffic studies are done. What is that old finding? The button, you know, what is it? What is a traffic study on 9A telling you about resiliency as needed on North End Avenue? The traffic counts were part of the EIS, like the data gathering from the EIS. So it's sort of it's it ties into looking at volumes and then looking at impacts long term project. That's why that data was being gathered along the way and the other locations throughout better city. There's you know, like I said, I mean, you, you raise a valid point, like for just to have a sense of like where and what parts of the project they weigh in on, because I think that you make a valid point to people, to the general public. I think it's like, well, it's better. For I, I believe that we will have, um, we will have much more clarity, um, um on that by the time we have our, our meeting in you know, our next meeting, um, after we get into September, we should have a lot more um, insight on that, and we'll share that with you. That sounds great. I mean, I, I just, I'll go back. Well, anyway, I don't want to repeat myself, but I'll let's just get somebody else. Justine, you're up. 
Thank you so much. No, I just was going to say thank you for agreeing to do all this because I know this is a, it's a, it's a um, step forward, and I'm really appreciative of the effort that the BPCA is making on this regard. And uh, yeah, so looking forward to the financial presentation uh, September 6th. I'd love it to include something about resiliency, the bonding, and all that, and how things are going to get paid for, um, and then. I'm assuming you're not going to get any walkthroughs in before my meeting, so you're going to have to. We'll be focusing after that, which is fine. Um, but that I think will by nature and timing push us into October. So that's it. I want to say thank you and I appreciate it. And beyond the bonding, the question is cost. For oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we got estimates of how much. What I see for master plan is. Funded and not the conversation of cost and reaches for design choices when there were still questions out there might be a very important conversation to have and how they work in with each other. I'm not able to answer because I can't hear your. Yeah. I can't hear it either. So Nick understands. Well, and Gwen, you know, when we looked at resiliency at the ball fields, I use that as the best case example. There were two presentations of two different plans, lots of discussion, kind of back and forth. And even through the process, we ended up changing course to ask you to pursue a less expensive, less duplicate duplicative process, which saved money in the long run. Cost estimates went up during the project, et cetera, et cetera. More issues with parts of the building, I get that. But it was a good process because it was discussion about design options and costs and risk. And the public got to weigh in, and that was a great partnership. Yes, it was. I, I agree. Well said, Tammy, because that's that is the point. Thank you. Okay, Wendy, you have a yeah, I, I just wanted to say kind of what Justine and everyone else is saying is that um I watched a lot of videos today. I I rewatched a lot of those summaries. Um, um, I totally did my homework. Happy yeah. Monday, Wendy. And, um yeah, I did and, too. Yeah. <laughs> so um I didn't take notes though because I was so overwhelmed. I started doing that and I got like crazy. But anyway, that's a separate story. But um, but what I wanted to say, what I heard from listening to that all over again is that that there are different constituents. So the people that live there that are worried about like how much is it going to cost? I mean, literally, one guy's like, if you make the straight the path straight instead of curved, it's going to be cheaper, right? So like you know that was a comment. <laughs> Remember that guy, right? <laughs> So we have the Costco group, you know, I'm going to call them <laughs> and I'm a Costco shopper and member. So, um, and you know, listen, these glasses came from Costco. So, you know, the whole thing. So, like, I love Costco, but I want it to be stylish. So I think that there's like the whole idea of the, of what the next meetings will be is to say, for those of you who are worried about cost and stylish. You know, we we are we are doing what we can, and to really just lean into that in a big way. And then for people that are interested in like how this fits in with the rest of the city, um, you know, because that's a different group of people, yep. you know, and and the the people that are using the water and and all this kind of stuff. And that's the tricky part for you right now is that we are not all coming from the same point of view in terms of getting this done. And you know, I'm sure there's a small fraction of people that don't want any of it. Um, that's a separate story, but I think most people want something, but they want it from a different point of view. So that's, that's not an easy, uh, response is what I'm trying to say. And, and to Jeff's point, I think that, um, I'm curious because also 1 of the things I heard over and over again, is people said about like, well, well, I want the playground to be on the park side to be connected to the park, but. You know, if the plants all get damaged in the flood, we're going to fix those, right? I mean, that came up more than once. So I think there's a big disconnect too in terms of like how much it's going to cost you. I mean, and what pot of money does that come out of? I mean, I, I don't know if the pot of money to replace plants is the same pot of money 
that builds the wall for resiliency? I'm guessing not, but I don't know the answer to that. So those are the things that like when I would listen to the whole thing, I think you're saying like these are going to be our, you know, resiliency in the wall and people were talking about, you know, how much of the sidewalk are you taking or if you, you know, how much of the road? I mean, there were there were things like that that came up as well because there are drivers that care care a lot about, you know, if they can unload and during construction, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just listening to all of it. The I'd like to consolidate it a little bit more, not reach by reach, but to let everyone to, you know, go on the walking tours again to talk about the costs and then to raise the big issues again. And for you to be very sophisticated to know how you're answering the question based on like who that constituent might be. You know, if it's a resident who's worried about their car. That's very different than a mom who, you know, wants the playground to be the playground sand to be cleaned right away after the flood. And if we're getting regular flooding, you know, can you use the park? You know, so there's going to be a lot of that, you know, the the sand replacement. I did that after 9-11, you know, everybody knows that story, you know, that that can get contaminated. You know, it gets very. It gets very tricky. So anyway, that I'm blabbering too much. Wait, this sounds very complicated. I'm not yeah. sure we want to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I no, but I think you make a valid point that there's. I think we've seen yeah, throughout yeah. this process there's like any number of stakeholders and people who have an interest, and everybody's interest is very specific to their own interest. To be to put it very plainly. Yeah, so I think we need to think about. I don't know how you do that exactly. I mean, I'm not smart enough, but maybe that is you know a combination of written questions and being sophisticated in the room, but I, I would like to Jeff's point to make it more of like a, those of you who, you know, really care about this and show up and ask us the question again, you know, here's what we've come up with. And some of the answer, answer might be, we made the tough choice to do X right. and you might not like X, but we've made the decision to do X. Here's why. And okay. here's why. And you're, you know, you're, and this will be the outcome and, you know, we can't please everyone all the time. I mean, we've talked about that as well. Um, but this is an opportunity and, yeah. and, you know, and over many years for so much to engage with your public, some quite sophisticated in ways to make things better. You heard it tonight. There were lots of interesting ideas that came up that the they projects. were very receptive to, at, um, you know, mayor's office. And I think that, that this is an opportunity for the authority. Again, you've done it before where there are plenty of people with plenty of ideas that are worthy of consideration. There are principles that this board has advocated for and supported, which are very clear, which are stated and which are in our bylaws or somewhere on the site, which, you know, all about passive natural based solutions and such to talk about the big items. I couldn't agree more with Jeff about the idea of looking at this holistically. I never really understood this chunking of any kind of landscape. I, I appreciate you have to do it that way, I guess, in terms of organization, but I agree that the bigger overarching ideas throughout the entire length of the Battery Park City should be looked at because one piece is connected to another, and that's the beauty of your park. And the fact that we're looking at this like this and this is so difficult for anyone, even a professional like myself, to really conceive of what's going on. And in that vein, critical to this process to me is clarity of what we will see. Because you are actually going to build this, unlike many other people. We will maybe all dead and gone. But your project we may live to see. And as a result, we should know now what it is we are going to live to see. So the walkthroughs, models, perspectives from the ground, quality of the materials. People want to know what is that wall made out of? Talk about something that why can't it be glass? Well, we know it can't be glass too expensive. Fine, that's the answer. We look at it, there's glass at the, in front of the Jewish Heritage Museum, but there's not two blocks north. What does that mean? We have to understand that. And I don't know, it's an incredibly difficult task for the likes of you and Garrett and all you, you know, as the designers, but that has to be imparted before it goes further into construction, you know, and into implementation. We have to be able to understand the whole and all of the major issues and the design issues that you really are grappling with looking at it in its entirety. I agree with Jeff, you know, looking at the big picture. Sure. And I think you have to do that with giving us even more information in this next visit, whenever it's going to be, with a way that maybe the big model, the air, you know, more of the aerial, so people really, I, I could answer, somebody said to me, what's it going to look like? I could answer that question. 
You know, and I can answer it now in Wagner Park, but I can't answer it for most of the other areas. I really can't. And I'm paying attention probably more than the average Joe. So it's just something to consider. I think a lot of people need that. I don't know if I'm. And when we talk aerial, I'm not talking, talking about the drone. Drone. No, it's like I'm humble. talking about. Right. Human scale. Human scale. And show I, use, I use that word a lot. If I'm walking down the street, what do I see? Not what. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar sees from up there, what does the average height person say? And down to each street, just like just pointing out, and what does it mean to access the water or not? How far above you are? You know, the, what does it look like from the waterfront? Do we have an opportunity to access the water? Is there any engagement with the water? Is there any opening for emergency egress, which we know we needed on 9-11? Where are those opportunities in this plan being included? So I think the holistic view is the right way to go and not the, you know, peaceful. Well, and we need to identify the issues that we think are important so that we can make sure that they are addressed. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, well, no time like the present, but I think some of these things are being stated tonight. I mean, you've mentioned mm -hmm. the Vista. We talked about the sort of materiality. What are these things made out of? You know, what are the plantings? Um, I, I mean, there's input. But, but to some extent, these yep. kinds of comments are exactly what we want them to take into account. You don't necessarily answer us in response to them. They are feedback that we want you to take into account for the 60%. That's right. Uh, yeah. 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 But then like, that just that yeah. needs to be said. This will be considered in X phase. Right. There are certain decisions that can be made at certain times or certain decisions that can't be made until you get to a different milestone in the project. And you want to be able to be clear about what decisions can be made when and why and how that affects the steps that are to come. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, I'm sure. I think yeah. it's clear. I hope. Does anyone else have anything to add online or in the room? Um, well, okay. I mean, it, it sounds like you're getting back to us with all of the answers to the different comments and questions that we've been provided to you at these meetings. Um, and with the timeline as to when we will then next address all of the bigger issues. Let's and talk about how the next month looks once we get to the next. As when it's in the next seven to ten days, what kind of the different components we want to have happen, and then sequence it in a way that makes sense. So it's like the walking tours and the meeting, but we want to make sure that once we get some some additional insights from the project team, how we can sequence that so it makes sense for the fall. And we want to sequence it so it does not overlap with anything that's right. going on. Right. With right. The and, other guys. Right. Anything that Fed IC for any of these other project related that doesn't interfere with your meetings, we want to make sure that we maximize participation, which is what we always try to do. And make sure that we're not over scheduling so people feel like they have to make a choice as to where they go. So Correct. I think it's going to be again, it's going to be it's a bear to do, but we'll figure out the best way that we can do it so that we no. don't interfere with anything. I think we have we have five months left in 2023. I don't think we have to squeeze it all into the month of September. Yeah, I mean that's fair too. So right understood. Is anyone open to having one of the tours on the community board full board meeting, like before the full board? To you know, it, is that too much to ask? Because I just think that in like, snow in December, no, no I think no, it's perfect. Not, to, not it's tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> December. You know, whether that's September or October, when the weather's still nice, but like the full board meet. Because I just think that at least I don't know how everybody else is. I feel like well, let's see if yeah. Nick can hook us up with a lovely space that we can do a beautiful hybrid in, and we can walk and talk. You're going to need more than one meeting, though, because obviously. No, no, there'll be more than one yeah. team. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I just yeah. think that like, yeah. in terms of like a lot of people are in community board mode that day. Anyway, then, right. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I just so they're already, they're already in in early from work. Yeah. A lot of times, yeah. like it's a, a day. I can think of a couple lovely locations that we could work on that. Um, I'm going to reiterate the original point I made, which is we had one public meeting on these reaches, maybe two, and we had 20. Um, Wagner Park, and we need a little bit more information to stick yeah. our teeth in yeah. and grab yeah. onto it. And you can yeah. then run with that at sixty percent. That's, I think that's to me. I, I don't know where I see one hundred and twenty percent. I understand. I think it's yeah. And I mean, there's just to be like, just to be really clear, and Peter can probably test this and so we Like a lot of the questions you're asking, of, like when we are trying to present things, we have conversations amongst ourselves about these same things. Exactly. Like it's right. a it's a very large project, and trying to to your point, Alice, about reaches. It's a way to make it digestible, but also it's not seven projects. It's one large project. So again, it's like the, the struggle is, is legitimate in how you present it in a way that's digestible and understandable and frankly, like not super wonky. So people just 
sort of gla like glaze over and don't pay attention to it, like what and, you're saying. Because and, not for lack of interest, just because it's and like, think completely... about the amount of city engagement we've had for the years, years, not months, but years, and they're at ten to twenty percent, and we've had way more engagement. And I would almost suffice to say that the land mass that they're talking about for Fide IC port is nowhere near as large as the land mass that you're talking about from North Moore down to South Dakota. Just in terms of scope and scale and size. It's different if they're only two problems are more difficult. Yeah. 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 In a way, their problems are worse. Aren't yeah. In, yeah. But, I mean, but I'm looking at public engagement and where the public has the opportunity. Alice is talking 20 meetings. She's not off. She's not off in her numbers when you're looking at scope and scale. Wagner, you know, puree and the battery. Look, I haven't done a count of the meetings and I listed. Um, what I would say though is yes, to, to, so the, the so we have it as the context. I haven't done the count. I can look back. If it's let's just say for argument's sake, it's 20. That's 20% though of the Wagner design complete. We're not yet done with presenting the 30% design for the project. So it's not like it's 20 for all and we only did one. Where were we when we 30% of Wagner, right? And also, yeah. I know, but also the presentations you did in the South, we spent perhaps the majority of the time talking about Wagner, but all those presentations, I know, because I sat them like through them like you did, they had all the segments of the project in them. We just spent a ton of time focused on Wagner. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like it was just about Wagner. Nonetheless, yes, we've done a lot of outreach already on the Northwest project. We're very proud of the outreach we did. We want to continue to expand on it and we'll make sure that people have their questions answered. But that, at 20 that, to 1, I just go well, right. Get yes. the answers because otherwise yeah. it's just a disaster. Right. 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 So that's all that we're asking. Right. And that's great. And I did, and I would say just lastly, as far as like a, a sort of a money spent, a physical model of this, you know, as well as the aerial, you know, Glide throughs would be so helpful. I mean, there's just a way to see the whole stretch of it and understand the elevations and where to see. I, I don't know how people yeah. see it otherwise. I don't know if that's been done by any of the architects, you know, in the landscape work. They've been must have built models for this. So, I don't, you know, right. I, I would just hope that yeah, I think that we are, do have them to share them like you did the last. Right, we did it at South Park. Exactly. Right. Right. When we have the final models that we right. share. So, there are just with, people that you know, only see things um, when they can touch them. Yeah, here, here. it's like a one stop yeah. shop. Anyway, I think we're going to do budget requests <laughs> next no. September. Oh Thank you guys. Okay. Thank you so, Thank so you much. Thank Thank you. Yeah. Thank really you. Appreciate Thank it. Really appreciate time. You. So, budget for next for September. I did take notes on it. I, I hope, hope I know you would have you would have done your homework, but it is important to highlight what it is we're going to want to put in next year's budget. And a lot of what we have is actually really good and has nothing to happen to on any of the things we want to add them down. Yeah. 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 Projects yeah. take a long time. Yeah. And thank you for everybody. Thank yeah. you, yeah. online people, and thank you for all your patience. And, and with that, we are adjourned. And I am so Thank you. Thank you.